Welcome to the Bakersfield City Council meeting. This television broadcast is brought to you by the local cable companies, the County of Kern and the City of Bakersfield. You can watch the rebroadcast of this meeting Saturday at 7 p.m., Sunday at 10 a.m., and the following Wednesday at 7 p.m. You can download the agenda for this meeting at www.bakersfieldcity.us. Presiding over this evening's meeting, the Honorable Mayor Karen K. Go. Good evening. It's my pleasure to call to order the 515 City Council meeting of June 24, 2020. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Go. Here. Councilmember Parlier. Here. Councilmember Rivera. Councilmember Gonzalez. Here. Councilmember Weir. Councilmember Weir, can you please unmute your phone? We are unable to hear you. Councilmember Smith. I am here. Councilmember Freeman. Councilmember Freeman, please unmute your phone. Here. Thank you. Councilmember Sullivan. And that should be it. Thank you very much. We're still under Governor Newsom's COVID-19 guidance, including the suspension of some components of the Brown Act related to public meetings, such as the one tonight. And as such, Councilmember Smith, Freeman, and Weir are joining the meeting by phone, and all council votes tonight will be conducted by roll call. And at this time, our fire chief, Anthony Galgeza, will offer the invocation. And then following the invocation, our vice mayor, Parlier, will lead us in the flag, in, in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you all please stand? Chief? Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you for this important meeting today. We ask for guidance, direction, prudence, wisdom, and knowledge for our council and our mayor to make the decisions that are critical to this city's outcome each and every year. We ask that you would bless them, bless this city, bless it with calmness, kindness, patience, and your peace that transcends all understanding. We just ask for that continued guidance, the wisdom and knowledge throughout this room, and we just thank you for the city that we live in. We ask that you would help it grow and prosper as you see fit. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and you may be seated. Mayor. Would you mind, could we try Council Member Weir again? He was, uh, I think perhaps now he's unmuted. Council Member Weir? Are you there? All right, we'll go on and then once we make contact, we will have him respond. Well, welcome everyone. It's so great to see all of you here participating in the civic process. We wish that uh, all of you who are out in the lobby would be able to fit in, but we're just not able to do that at this time, but we're really grateful that you're here. Here are a few guidelines to help our meeting run smoothly. We request that you turn off your phones. In keeping with council policy, council members aren't allowed to send or receive electronic communications during the meeting. Please be courteous in the use of cameras and videos. Applause is allowed during the presentations portion of the meeting, but it isn't allowed during other parts of the meeting for, um, and for safety reasons. And as a courtesy to others, no signs are allowed in the council chamber. I know many of you um, are here for the very first time, and we're just so glad to have you all participating with us. So, Madam Clerk, would you please read the first item? Under presentations, we have a proclamation to Diane Hoover, Recreation and Parks Director, declaring Recreation Parks Month in Bakersfield during July 2020. 
Well, thank you. And normally I would be coming down there, but Ms. Hoover, I'm going to ask you to come up here. I'm going to read it from up here, and, and uh, we will celebrate anyway. You know, parks are just so important, and during this time when so many of us have been confined to our homes, we see the parks being used more than ever. You know, quality parks and recreation, those are cited among the top three reasons that businesses choose relocation in uh, a number of studies. And so we are just so thankful that our, our parks and recreation department contribute so much to the quality of life. And so it's my privilege to read the following proclamation. Whereas recreation programs and parks are essential to communities across America, including the city of Bakersfield, and whereas parks and recreation are fundamental in establishing and maintaining our community's quality of life by offering citizens the opportunity to participate in recreational activities for improved health while contributing to the economic and environmental well-being of our community, increasing property values, expanding local tax base, growing tourism, attracting and retaining businesses, and reducing crime. And whereas recreation is invaluable to residents in providing positive alternatives for children and youth, especially during non-school hours, and whereas parks and green spaces remove pollution from the air, lower city temperatures, and aid in capturing and storing water, now, therefore, I, Karen Go, Mayor of the City of Bakersfield, do hereby proclaim July 2020 as Recreation and Parks Month in our city and urge all residents to enjoy and recognize the social, physical, mental, economic, environmental, and community benefits derived from city parks, streetscapes, programs, and partnerships. It's dated at Bakersfield, California, this 24th day of June 2020. Ms. Diane Hoover, our Parks and Recreation uh, Director, I am so pleased to present this to you. I will give it to you this way, if that's okay. Let's give it up for her. And thank you for the wonderful parks that we enjoy. And to you now. Thank you, Mayor Go, And thank you, members of City Council, city staff, and members in the audience as well. Since 1985, Americans have recognized July as Parks and Recreation Month. I want to say a few words about this year's challenges due to COVID-19. In the past three months, 83% Americans nationwide have visited parks or trails. In Bakersfield, park and recreation staff saw daily attendance in parks nearly double, and on the bike path, triple. Staff kept the parks clean, open, as well as the restrooms clean and open. They followed the guidelines for closing these things and then that things, and then were able to open a few things, and, and even uh, in July, we will now be able to open uh, some of the pools on a limited basis, so very excited about that. And we, uh, we were able to open the spray parks uh, just a couple weeks ago. So in this year's uh, nationwide uh, July is Parks and Recreation Month, they're encouraging everyone to thank a park and recreation staff member. When you see recreation giving out food to uh, the children at the Martin Luther King Center or providing a service online to teach about some activities you can do at home with your family, thank them. Thank a park staff that works all the time, hot weather, cold weather, in between weather, <laughs> everything else to keep the parks mowed clean and safe. So I thank you and Mayor Go, in honor of all the support you give us all the time, you come to all of our events, I want to make you an honorary Recreation and Parks staff member. Wow, I am very honored. Thank you so much, Ms. Hoover, and we just appreciate your team, all your hard work. Thank you very much. Oh, look, here I go, I'm official. Well, thank you. And now it's time for public statements. Due to the governor's executive order, which waived the Brown Act provisions 
requiring physical presence of the public in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, public comments have been encouraged to be made through email and phone call to the city clerk. Those received in such manner have already been provided to the council. So now we will receive public statements. All statements are given a three minute time limit, 15 minutes per topic. So I know some of you haven't been here before, but that's 15 minutes for that entire topic. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, please give those to the clerk and she'll make sure that council receives copies. Please avoid any behavior that disrupts the meeting. We're very interested and concerned with your issues. Due to the public notice requirement of the Brown Act, the council can't take action when an item isn't on the agenda. The council can, however, refer your matter to committee or request that staff contact you. And so we may not be offering comments right after you speak. That doesn't mean we're not interested. We, that's just not how the protocol works, but we're really listening to you. So Madam Clerk, now uh, do we have public speakers? Would you please announce uh, whatever we've received? Mayor Go, before we proceed, um, uh, I have been informed that Councilmember Weir, uh, we are now able to hear him, and I just want to confirm, Councilmember Weir, can you hear us? I can hear you. Thank you, Councilmember. Mayor Go, a staff memorandum has been received and provided to the Council transmitting um, public comments received through email and by phone. Any additional comments received by email and by phone message will be compiled and provided to the Council and the public at the conclusion of the meeting, as well as made part of the record. We have received 28 speaker cards this evening. Uh, 22 of them regarding the budget item, three regarding backyard hens, and three regarding separate subjects. The first public speaker this evening is Curtis Bingham. Okay, and if you just hold one second, and three on separate subjects? Correct. Okay, thank you. So typically, we have 15 minutes per topic, and I see that we have 22 people who want to speak on the budget. That's, that's a lot of people. And so if you think about three minutes, typically that would have been 15 minutes. So I'm going to extend that portion because it is very important to all of us. We want to hear you. But that means 22 people are, I'm going to move it from 15 minutes to 30 minutes. So I'll double the time that we normally have. So that just means that I'm going to ask you to be considerate during that time so that we can try to get 22 in. But, you know, you can do the math yourself and try to figure out to be courteous to your um, fellow citizens. Uh, let's try to get all of those in, as many as we can. Mr. Bigham. I can move this up, can Well, Honorable Mayor and to the board, my name is Curtis Jane Bingham, Sr., servant of our Lord and Savior, God Almighty, Jesus Christ, who truly is the only begotten Son of our Holy Heavenly Father, God Almighty. Uh, thank you for when God we trust. Lord, tell us to bless our leaders, and so I'd like to bless you guys with the word integrity. I've been coming a long time, and I've been uh, watching you guys do things, and you know I'm a great servant of law enforcement, and you know Romans chapter 13, the Lord tell us that he's leader of law enforcement, and they are his ministers. And so uh, concerning this uh, budget, uh, it's already made out and everything. You ready to give them their budget and everything? Well, no problem. Soon as something happened up in Minnesota, now people want to question our budget. Well, we got to be fair and square, and we got to be true. Bakersfield ain't Minnesota. See, we got people down here doing an excellent job in law enforcement. There's nowhere in the world anybody should be messing with their money because what Minnesota done done or what Atlanta done done. We done had problems down here, but most of them have been solved. A lot of the people have been compensated that need to be compensated. We can't keep revisiting over and over punish, trying to punish law enforcement in Bakersfield about something that's already been taken care of. So I pray you keep your integrity and let your budget stay as you already got it. You ready to go with it? Let it stay. Because it's a shame anybody would want to fool with it. The Lord tell us what? This world shall end by evil. And we got a person coming in called the Antichrist. He's on his way. And the Bible says he won't get here till the restrainer is taken out of the way. Well, law enforcement is a restrainer, restraining all this evil. Uh, they just got a guy last week. Uh, $5 million worth of dope. This is one guy. Another individual I'm paying attention to 
uh, when they caught him. He had $114 million of his own he turned in. Another guy had $300 million in his basement. And you know, if you know, a lot of people around the world came in to bid on some of his paintings and everything. So if you were to look at law enforcement, if you just, just took the undercover department, they could use their entire budget they sell. It's a shame for them going out there trying to get all these drugs because drugs is destroying the whole world. And why? Because they got money and our law enforcement lover don't have the money, see? So when you're talking about budget cutting them, you got to be kidding. They could use it themselves, the, the, the undercover department themselves, to get things going. The D.A.R.E. program is gone. All the little kids, many of them getting out there using drugs now, don't have the help because of the money. So we just got to remember what we're doing. Thank God we got a new city manager, and the Lord gave us a new prince, and uh, Chief Greg Terry. Thank you for him, that new, considering this certain time that we got going on right now. And some of these other groups that's crying about taking money from law enforcement, you need to get on the boat the right way and get in line and come talk to the board and see if you can get some of this 1% money for yourself and start your own program. But to mess with the biggest or the organization, our foundation is law enforcement, fire department, and district attorney. To mess with that, you got to be kidding Mr. with all Bingham. this evil that's taking place. Mr. So Bingham. come on in and try to get you some funds yourself and get a program going to help people. Thank you. Your time is oh, ended. So Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Mayor. Pray God bless everybody. Thank you. And then, Madam Clerk, let's take the topics that aren't on that big budget uh, first so we can group those together. So you have uh, the separate topics and then the backyard hens. Either you can mix those up any way that you think is appropriate. Ron White. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. And the next person after that, if you just get ready to speak, uh, Madam Clerk, would you announce that person, please? Brandon Chambly. So, Brandon, if you would just uh, stand over here to the side. Mr. White, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and go ahead. Thank you for being with us. Yes, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, Mayor Go, Council members. Um, I'm going to make this brief in lieu of the mask and in lieu of the heat. Thank you once again for the opportunity. Um, I know there's a lot of folks behind me, so I'm going to get right to the point. I want to make sure that everybody puts a face to this project, if I can move this up a little bit. Um, I represent Golden Empire Youth Tackle Football and Cheer. I'm the executive director. I want to put a face to the next phase of Kaiser Permanente Sports Village. We represent 25,000 at minimum households in Kern County. What's important about that is there's an absolute field shortage in Kern County. We want to continue to provide services for our family members, for our kids. It's also important to note that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle as you're looking at youth athletics is just who we represent. A large majority of our participants, those 25,000 households that I mentioned, are considered to be at or below the poverty line. Oftentimes families from food insecure environments and a large number of our participants are considered to be at risk. If Diane Hoover is still in here, she'll tell you our organization um, has been talking to her for 10 years. Councilman Sullivan, we've, we've spoke on this very topic. We're now to a point where we can service more families when more families need that service. I can tell you this personally, as a retired law enforcement officer in this state, if you do not provide alternatives for our youth, most often, and I'm from this community, I'm not the outside looking in, I grew up here. If you don't provide alternatives for our youth, the future of our community, the results more than often are not favorable. I know when you set up here, and you don't see me here weekly, I don't make it here a lot, um, you have the task of making tough decisions. But when you're looking at the next phase of the Kaiser Sports Village, please look at it more than a line item. Look at it as what it represents in our community, who it represents, and who it will serve. Last thing, everything we do, unfortunately, unfortunately, has a fiscal impact. These are not just fields for practice and games. Kern County has a rich football tradition. We, we've had multiple players drafted. In the first round, we just had Jordan Love drafted, right? I want to certainly give a shout out to him. 
But with this facility, in terms of fiscal impact, we now will have the ability to have regional, state, and potentially even national tournaments because we're centrally located. It's just a good decision to give back, serve our families, and those same 25,000 members that we've talked about here today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mr. Shambly, and then would you uh, call the next one to wait in line too, please. The following three speakers will be speaking on backyard hens. M.T. Marikel, Jack Marikel, and Luke Romanini. Mr. Shambly. Madam Mayor, um, I have copies of my notes. I won't go over the three minute limit, but. You can give those to uh, the clerk. Thank you very much. So as I've tried to stay informed about COVID-19 and all the requirements and, excuse me, this mask is making my glasses fog up, and all the new rules and requirements surrounding the outbreak, um, I've become increasingly concerned about the health effects of having people wear a mask eight, eight hours a day or more. I'd just like to highlight a few of the pieces of research that I've come across and these come from places like the Centers for Disease Control, OSHA, the World Health Organization. So it's accredited and, and reputable sources. It's not just crackpots on the internet. Um, I found in my research that increased CO2 leads to shortness of breath, increased heart rate, headaches, fatigue, brain damage. The body's reaction to CO2 toxicity impedes hearing, vision, and perception. It increases cortisol and sustained levels are harmful to the immune system. Um, the World Health Organization warns against self-contamination by touching masks, which untrained people do quite often. It says the reuse of masks increases contamination, warns, they warn of potential breathing difficulties and a false sense of security. The Annals of Internal Medicine say that not even surgical masks are effective at filtering COVID from coughs. Particles pass through masks. Cloth masks increase the risk of infection, particularly when people aren't washing them and they're reusing them from day to day. I've been to several establishments, retail establishments, that have asked me even just to pull my shirt up over my face as an alternative to a mask. They're accepting whatever face covering is out there which is not in line with medical guidelines or any kind of science. These, these steps, I don't believe, are doing any good medically. I believe they're actually harming us. And section 1910 of OSHA's guidelines, it says that cloth face coverings will not protect the wearer against airborne transmissible in infections agents due to a loose fit and a lack of seal or inadequate filtration. And there's more there for you, for you all to review. Um, you know, the bottom line is that these things are gonna do more harm than good. They don't seal in or seal out contaminants. They cause us to rebreathe our own CO, carbon dioxide. People are passing out. People are wearing them at times when they don't need to. Even the regulations on our businesses, I feel are gonna, are already hurting our economy. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for speaking. Madam Clerk, next speaker, please. M.T. Marikel. My name is M.T. Marikel. I spoke at the June 10th meeting and I shared with you that many Bakersfield residents are actively meeting, planning, and working together to allow for the ownership of backyard hens. We are asking City Council to expand the current zoning to include R1 lots for backyard hen ownership. I would like to publicly recognize and thank the city departments that I have been in contact with over the past two weeks. Paul Johnson, city planner, Ginny Gennaro, city attorney, Billy Owens, code enforcement, have all been reachable, professional, helpful, and knowledgeable. I have also been able to reach and communicate with several city council members and have appreciated their insights, comments, and support. 
I have written and provided a one-page executive summary document with two additional resources, the benefits of backyard hens and counterpoints to the most common concerns when considering backyard hen ownership. I hope you find these informative and easy to read. You are always welcome to reach out to me for additional information or discussions. I would like to conclude by reminding you that the main reason citizens want to be able to legally own backyard hens continues to be food security, bug control, nutritious eggs, and pet companionship. These are all important topics for the health and welfare of the residents of Bakersfield. Thank you for your time and this opportunity to be heard. Thank you, Mr. Marico. Next speaker, please. And I would ask, when you're waiting back there, just make sure that you try to social distance as much as possible. Next speaker, please. Jack Marikel. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Hello. My name is Jack Miracle. I'm a 14-year-old that will be attending Bakersfield High School in the fall. I'm here tonight to share with you that it is important to me on expanding the city ordinance to allow back, back, backyard hens in the R1 zone. I have owned backyard hens in the past and they were wonderful pets. Our families had four hens, one for each family member. My hen was a Dominique and was named Grain. She produced about five eggs a week and would let me hold and pet her. I wanted to know my main reason for wanting to be able to have backyard hens has to do with reliable, nutritious, and organic food source. Athletics are very important to me. Last year, I was one of the 10 goalies nationwide in my age group for water polo that, that qualified to be invited to train with Olympic development team. While at BHS, I plan on competing in water polo, wrestling, and swimming. After high school, it is my goal to attend a Navy Academy and play water polo for their team. I share this with you because nutrition is important to me as I'm growing and trying to reach my athletic goals. Chicken eggs are very healthy and nutritious. They're one of my favorite foods. I can easily eat six eggs a day. I put fried eggs on most of my meals, hamburgers, toast, even top ramen. I hard boil a, a dozen eggs to keep them in the refrigerator as a go snack for me throughout the day. They're full of protein and essential vitamins. Thank you for considering my topic, my viewpoint, and for helping me make it legal for me to own backyard hens. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Luke Ro Romanini. Welcome, please introduce yourself. May I take the mask off to speak? All right. Uh, my name is Luke Romanini. My family had five chickens in our backyard in Stockdale Estates for about three years when I was in elementary school. During this time, the chickens lived in a fenced area that my dad built in the side of the yard. We were very proud of our coop and our hens. We never had a problem with a chicken escaping. It was my responsibility to feed the hens and to make sure the coop was clean and odor free. I remember how excited I used to get when I got to collect their eggs. Sometimes we had extra eggs and we were able to share them with our neighbors, friends, and family. Our neighbors knew about our backyard chickens and enjoyed them also, and they would often come over to visit and collect eggs from the chickens. It was really fun to be able to get these edible eggs from our backyard, and everyone in my family was disappointed to see the chickens go. But we eventually had to give them away to a friend that did not live in a Bakersfield residential area because my family was very busy with school and sports but I would like an opportunity to possibly own chickens in the future again. Thank you for listening uh, and considering expanding the city ordinance to allow backyard chickens where I currently live. Thank you, Mr. Romanini. Madam Clerk, next speaker. Do we have any others on topics other than the budget? Okay, so now we're entering the budget phase. Typically, we would have 15 minutes for this segment. We're gonna double that time, and so, um, just recognize there are 22 people who want to speak related to the budget. And we'll go ahead and have you call the first speaker and then the second speaker, if you would just wait there, we'll just do one additional person waiting in line. But again, for clarification, it's only three minutes per person, correct? Correct. And we have 22 people that we're going to try to get in to 30 minutes. So you don't have to use all of your three minutes. Dalton James and Tanya Hood. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. 
Hi, my name is Dalton Jones. Um, I'm here on behalf of the People's Budget Bakersfield. So long story short, the People's Budget Bakersfield is a group of community members, as well as organizations who have been working on the budget, as well as policing for years at this point. Um, I'm gonna take this off, this is too much. Um, we've been working on the budget and policing for a long time. And as most people know in this room, Bakersfield is the deadliest police force in the nation. And also if we look at the budget and we look at what we were able to like put together in a very short amount of time, the people whose morals are reflected on the budget that you all have the opportunity to adopt is not the whole community. It's just the people who have privilege and access to spaces like this. Um, one of the ways that I got into this was through Measure In. Measure In was supposed to be this great thing that was supposed to be able to fund public safety so we can reimagine what it looks like. But it honestly just ended up reinforcing status quo by giving a good chunk of its money to policing. The same police that honestly just lock up black people and kill people like Francisco Serna and James De La Rosa. Um, through my work in the community and through the work of the People's Budget as well as the EJC, we have been meeting not just now, but for the past year and some change with people like Willa Rivera, Andre Gonzalez, Mayor Go, on separate occasions to talk about this very thing in the budget, where we were told, yes, totally, we would love a participatory budgeting system with little effort and follow through. Yes, we would totally love to hear from community members, but you're not gonna respond to voicemails or emails from people. And now we're here in a time where we're seeing at least two to three execution videos of black people a day. Five black men have been lynched in this country. I wanna say two or three are in this, this state. And we're still arguing whether or not we should reallocate police funding. We need to reallocate police funding because the communities that the police are literally like killing are neighborhoods like Lakeview, AKA MLK, AKA the Mayflower District. This neighborhood, the only investment this neighborhood is honestly really getting is products so you can survey them and literally arrest them. That's not, that's not okay, that's not what the community wants. That's not, never what the community said they wanted. So I say, you need to listen to the community. You work for the community. You were literally elected by the people. I think you should listen to the people. They literally showed up and showed out today so you could listen to them. And then also, to the point of Andre Gonzalez, who was able to respond via media, but not via emails or text messages or calls, um, you've spent a lot of time in this community by way of organizing, but also by way of this position you're in, gaslighting people. You say you want to meet with community, so if you guys choose today, and I know there's four seconds left, great. Um, if you guys choose to adopt this budget today, I choose for you to, I would say to not adopt this budget today and actually hold another public meeting with the community so they can actually say what we want instead of saying, Your time is we up. would love to meet with you. Thank you for speaking. Thank you, sir. Um, wherever that's coming from, uh, that is not, allowed in the chamber so we just ask you to be respectful we're really glad that you're here and we're just asking that you'll be respectful thank you for coming here please introduce yourself hello my name is Tamaya um, I'm here to speak on behalf of the people's budget um, and I think it's really important for me to be here today because I have been working in the community for four years I moved down here um, in 2015 um, in the beginning of 2015, and I started to notice the urge for me to get involved to help protect our communities because Bakersfield in 2015 was rated the highest um, shootings amongst police and um, civilians. And so when I started to get involved, um, I'm a big researcher, so I started to dig deep. I started to look at the research. Um, I was able to, well, my community organization was able to get the ACLU to come to Bakersfield to do an, an, an investigation for BPD and KCSO. 
um, Kern County Sheriff's Office, and they did the two-year investigation. It was done in 2015, and the results were put out in 2017. This is a public document. This is not something that I'm making up. You can go on Google. You can type in ACLU Bakersfield um, Police Department report. It'll show you repeated shooters um, in regards to officers. It'll tell you if the person was unarmed. It gives you a plethora of information. And so fast forward to measure in, a lot of us voted for measure and I didn't, but a lot of the community members did because they recognized that it said public safety. But as we continue to gather, we recognized that most of the money was going to the police department. And to be honest, to be truthful, Kern County has a history. So this is nothing that started yesterday. This di didn't resonate since um, everything has been happening because of George Floyd, but there's a history of institutional and systemic racism within Bakersfield Police Department and Kern County Sheriff's Office. All of you that are standing in front of me, I, I, I heard you earlier, Mayor Go, say that you, you, you really want to hear our opinions. We've been trying to give input for four years now. Four years, and when Measure N was introduced and put on the ballot, there was a committee that community members were supposed to be able to sit on to decide where the funds should be allocated to. Well, none of the community members were chosen, and we found out that there was a hidden agenda. I know all about hidden agendas. I just graduated from Cal State Bakersfield with my master's degree in social work, so I've studied these things. The, 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 these, these things that are put on the ballot are portrayed as one thing, but then they're really implemented as something else. All of the money, we're, we're, we're asking you to defund the police department, defund the police department, and reallocate those funds to our communities. We need affordable housing. We need more access to mental health services. We need more intervention services, substance abuse. Um, we need better education systems. So we are here, in case you never heard this before, to tell you to defund the police department and help our communities. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker. Where is that coming from? Is that just outside? OK. Uh, officers, just, just deal with it appropriately. Um, no, 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 we just want it quiet out there. Um, okay, no, no. Uh, people in the lobby, uh, residents in the lobby, we're glad that you're here, but uh, just as I was saying, there's no applause that's allowed. We, we know that you're very passionate about the issues, but we're just going to ask you to... Uh, follow the protocol. Thank you very much. So, uh, Madam Clerk, next speaker, please. Jerry Pettiford and Fahima Salahuddin Floyd. Okay, so uh, you can go ahead and you can just wait over there. Thank you. Okay. I'm, my Welcome. name is Jerry Pettiford. Uh, actually, it's Marvin Pettiford. It's the nickname that I have. Anyway, I'm here about defunding and reallocation within the de police department. And I speak on behalf of the people's budget. Uh, I'm mumbling in here a little bit because I'm a little bit emo emotional with this. I am uh, an ex-police officer, so I do understand the need to have policemen in our society without any stretch in the imagination. However, the makeup and the structure of the police departments, not only here in Bakersfield, but nationally, nationally have been based on a premise, uh, unfortunately began with policing and re retraining, retraining, picking up slaves. That sort of mentality has continued on through the centuries of time. What has occurred is that we have a system that is broken. It sits and, and is run on the basis of racism, not perpetrated necessarily by all, but certainly by many. And when we talk about, when I talk about reallocation and defunding, the money that's given to the police department, some of that money could be done, used to investigate having additional services within the police department that address the needs of the community, that address the needs of the police department. The police officer can't be a social worker, a psychiatrist. Um, he or she cannot be a number of things. And the new look of the police department should not include those kinds of responsibilities. And the money offered to 
our community and to the police department for fixing the needs of the community should be reallocated to build a better uh, paradigm for our police department to look at and be parts of. Um, thank you, council members, Major Joe. Oh. Thank you for your comments. Are there people in the lobby who would like to come in here? We have a lot of empty seats, so officers, if you just let them in, we'd like to get as many people in here as possible. Uh, so just, uh, yeah, that would be helpful. And the next speaker, if you would come forward. You're going to have to monitor because we have limited number of seats. So, officers, can you just make sure we have enough of seats and just, we'll just wait a minute until we can get some people seated. And then as people leave, whoever's at the door, I just don't know whether we have people out there who are helping with this, then just let another person in as people leave. Okay, let's go ahead and get people seated, whoever, uh, are there some empty seats? Yeah, so just uh, it's a few people left, so if there are people who have left, let them fill those seats in. Okay, I think you've let in more people than the chambers hold. Yeah, it's 25, but a couple of people left, so we're just going to fill those in. Okay, uh, next speaker, welcome. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Fahima Salahuddin Floyd, and I'm here on behalf of the People's Budget Bakersfield. Um, as the people before me mentioned, the People's Budget Bakersfield is a coalition that is a long time in the making. Black and brown organizers have been uh, organizing around police reform since I was a teenager. I'm 35 now, I'm from Bakersfield, I live here, I have children. I want my children to grow up in a society and a community that is safe. Not safe just for white people, but safe for everyone. See, here's the thing. The, ter the police are the oldest domestic terrorist organization in the United States. They are insidious, they are, their roots are created from chattel slavery. You can't fix that. The time for police reform is over. The time for accountability is now. And so if you care about black people the way you claim to and you claim to and everyone claims to, then you will listen to what the people are saying to you tonight. Look at all of these people. We're not crazy. Not everyone is with our organization. Not everyone is here with the same group. However, we all have the same common goal, which is to protect black bodies at all costs. My daughter, who is eight years old, is afraid to go to the post office because she thinks the police will murder her. I cannot tell her that's false because time, history, and current events have shown that that is emphatically true. So we are asking you to defund BPD and adopt the budget that we've created that reflects what people in Bakersfield actually want. The time for symbolic gestures is over. Your silence is complacency. It is consent. If you don't listen tonight and you don't hear the people of Bakersfield, you are just as guilty as the murderers who continue to kill black people. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Tiara King and Patrick Jackson. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hi, Tiara King. So I'll be speaking today on behalf of the City Council's delayed response to what's going on in our community and the racial injustices. I'm curious to know what tangible actions have been taken by the City Council um, just to show any kind of support or, or anything in the community at this time. The City Council has received nearly two thousand emails and I mean beyond acknowledging that you guys have received those emails we've heard or seen nothing else please allow me to clarify that when we say we want our voices heard we also are desiring action the Fresno um, City Council they not only proclaimed a Black Lives Matter day but they also have already implemented the council that's necessary for community policing the time is up. 
and ignoring this vital issue is not an option because these problems, they're not going away. So today, I just want you guys to take action and I ask that you move towards transformation in this city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. King. Next speaker, please, and call the following one, too, please. Patrick Jackson and Nikki Teague. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Jackson. Thank you. Patrick Jackson, president of the NAACP. Again, like was stated earlier, um, this has not been a new topic or issue around police reform. Um, definitely are excited about the officers now having body cameras, but the action that Marigo, you just made of sending an officer to deal with a crowd that's making noise is the same issue that we're having as a community. And even talking with the chief and others in this council, the issue of this budget of putting so much money toward the police department, they even stated they don't want to respond to issues that's dealing with mental health. They only have one person and then they, they shut down at a certain time. They don't have the adequate hours for those individuals to respond when it comes to mental health issues. They want those monies to be allocated to, to help them. And so the people have been speaking out and saying these things, but you haven't been responding with action. A bunch of lip service, a bunch of photo ops, but no action. So are you going to be real leaders and listen to the people? Because Measure N was not for that reason or that purpose to fund the police department. It was to help our community move forward. And as we've been seeing time and time again, our community is not being heard and actions will be dealt with. Now, we've also asked for a community oversight committee that needs to be implemented for our police department. Our, our police departments need to understand that they cannot police themselves. When our citizens go to the internal affairs, they are now victims and not the people that should be uh, uh, subject to being investigated. So we believe that the people will have a voice to try to push forward an agenda item and we're requesting that whoever sits on that particular committee that we move forward of putting the police oversight committee on the agenda so that we can begin the process of implementing it in our police department in our city with that being said if you're going to run for a city council seat or want to be the mayor of the city you need to listen to the people so I encourage each and every one of you to look down in your spirit, look down into yourselves. Are you running for the people to sit here to listen to the people or are you interested in the people that are in your interest, that funnel the pockets of where the money is going? Sit down and pray. As you continue to pray, look deep within yourself and ask yourself that real question. Are you really concerned about the people or are you in this for alternative reasons? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. And let me just clarify, our officers are just here as the staff for tonight, and so uh, they're closest to the door, and so that's just the reason I made that comment. Uh, next speaker, please. Nikki Teague, after Nikki Teague, Kiki Navarro, and after Kiki Navarro, we have Jared Haig. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. I'm Nikki Teague, here on behalf of the people and the Next Step organization. Coming to the town hall meeting for the first time really opened my eyes. It showed me you are exactly who I think you are. I see no one who resembles me, so how could you possibly make a decision that would benef be beneficial to my livelihood? This isn't Minnesota, but ha we have our own local George Floyds here in Bakersfield. I hear all of these false hopes and see no, see no action. During the meetings, you showed me that you value property, vanity, and even hands over human lives. We have pleaded for, you hum for your humanity to show, and you don't budge. We ask you to stop killing us, and you refute. All we want is what you want for yourself and for your family, to live freely, to not worry about your skin igniting so much hating someone. We shouldn't have to worry about the possibility that when we make it back, that, that we won't make it back home. We want our youth to be able to grow up in a world where we don't have to train little black and brown kids on how to comply and submit for people like you to feel comfortable. I don't wanna, see, I don't wanna wait to see change later when you have the power to implement change now. 
I don't want to wait to be able to walk this world freely. I don't want to wait for people who resemble me or, my, or shades lighter than me to not be seen as a threat. I hear all of this talk of the future and how to make it better, but it must start now. What we should be discussing is now. What, what concerns me the most is that, that famous line that you all use, I have no power, we don't control this or that's that department. You simply ignore us and give us the runaround so you don't have to do your job. So you are not held accountable for the things that go on. I am no longer asking. We are no longer suggesting. We are demanding. So I tell you this not as a threat, but as an eye opener. If our demands to be seen and treated like human beings are not met, there will be consequences. You refuse to act out of fear, but if you don't comply, then you really should be afraid. I can't possibly feel that you, you can't possibly feel that you do your job right when we have to, we have to protest to stop overfunding the police and tell you to reallocate those funds into education and in lower income communities. You want Bakersfield to be desirable enough to attract tourists, but don't make it suitable for the current residents of Bakersfield. You would rather give millions to a system that creates murderers than, create our, than educate our youth and stimu stimulate lower income communities leveling the economic playing fields. There are parts of Bakersfield continuous be continuously being developed while the roads on the east side are, st are filled with potholes and barely have street lights. A liquor store, a smoke shop in every corner new fast food restaurants emerging, but we have yet have a Whole Foods. Homelessness is ever growing in is the ever growing issue and our local and our local government chooses to ignore. You force us to be products of our environment and wonder why there's civil unrest. I'm here to tell you your time is up. We are no longer we, we no longer accept what you want to give us because it is clear you do not have our best interests in mind and I am done. Thank you. Next speaker please. Uh, just a reminder that there's no applause allowed in the chamber. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. My name is Kiki Navarro, and I'm with BLM Baco. Um, I have been protesting for the last three weeks for change here in Bakersfield. The reason why I was out here, I'm not going to repeat myself because it's remedial. Everyone in this, this, this conference room has said the same feeling. So I'm, I'm just going to speak how I feel as a, a citizen here. I'm from New York originally, and I've always looked outside looking in. And Bakersfield is very segregated. You have people that stay on the east side, west side, south side. And then when you have functions here, they're so high priced that we can't go. It's like you're keeping the black dollar out. There's not a left people that love themselves on MLK because when I go to MLK, I see my brown brothers and sisters out there strung out on, on drugs. And then you want us to have a little parade like we're supposed to be happy about that. Everyone stays in their little pocket corners and, and, and does this. But I, I want to defund the police because I'm sick and tired of the segregation. Sipping the, sipping the Kool-Aid real slow like, you know, you're not sipping the Jim Crow <sighs> Kool-Aid. You're just sprinkling it on people. And not every cop is a bad cop, but when you have enough of them that are not speaking up to help our brothers and sisters, you have a display of brown people in here that are sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm out there because I want my children to not hear, monkey die, monkey die, get out of here, monkey. I'm done with that. In 1999, there was a sign in North Chester that said, stay out. How do you think that that makes me feel? to come from New York and hear my uncle say, don't go to Oildale, they'll kick you out. Three years ago, I went on Craigslist and I purchased a, a dress for my daughter on Manor. I was parked in community parking on the street by the driveway of the person that I was purchasing the dress. I had to have five other people to go with my daughter to make sure that she was safe to go to Oildale. As I was parked and breastfeeding my son, legally parked, mind you, west side facing west coming east towards me there's a big giant truck get away from my house <laughs> these are the things that we have to deal with as brown people and there are some mexicans that are white descent that that coast through and they don't feel that what we do is important but when you defund the cops it's not taking the money away from them but it's putting it back into community i'm done Thank you. Next speaker, please. Jared Haig. After Jared Haig, Elizabeth Spavento. After Elizabeth Spavento, we have Mitchell Rowland. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. 
Good afternoon. My name is Jared Haug. I'm here uh, speaking with the People's Budget. I'm also an adjunct professor at CSUB. Um, I'll be fairly brief and direct. Um, what we're asking you to do as part of the People's Budget to defund the police department is not a radical solution. Uh, we've seen defunding and disinvestment from largely the rest of the community in order to fund the police department, $325,000 a day. What we're asking you to do is simply apply the standards that, of disinvestment and defunding that you're applying to the rest of the community that you claim to be representing and apply that to the police department um, that is getting 41% of next year's budget. We're demanding that you start to speak for the entire community, not just the white, wealthy business people of the community, but the black and brown citizens of our community also. I'm tired of seeing solutions to homelessness be increased police. I'm tired of seeing solutions to mental health crises be increased police. We need to start putting money in other places um, and to start funding the actual community that you claim to be representing. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And is there another one that you can just announce after that one? After Thanks. Elizabeth, um, there's Mitchell Rowland. Thank you. Following Mitchell Rowland, it's Andrea. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Spavento. I'm a citizen in Bakersfield. I live in Ward 2. I just wanted to talk to you today um, because unlike the mayor and city council's budget, which gives almost half of the general funds to the BPD, the people's budget does not. Hundreds of survey takers determined that the city should prioritize universal needs such as housing, child care, healthy food, clean air and water, pandemic recovery, the built environment, and reimagine public safety over the needs of the police department. And I would argue that all of these things, when together, work in collaboration to help eliminate poverty, crime, a lot of the things that we think that the police are actually trying to do when their real main job is to enforce the law. Um, I'd like to remind you that this should come as no surprise, seeing, seeing that the Bakersfield Police Department was named the deadliest in the country in 2015. Not something that I'm proud of. Um, publications like The Guardian and Vanity Fair wrote extensively about it. You can find this information online. You've had five years to make significant changes and reforms to bring the police force in alignment with the needs of the community. And notice what I'm saying. I'm saying that the police force needs to be working with the community for these solutions, not against it. I'm sorry to say that I think you failed doing this to produce the kind of culture shift that this movement is calling for right now. We stand in solidarity, not just with the citizens of Bakersfield, but the rest of the citizens in 50 states across the country those that are standing in solidarity globally in other countries besides ours for the rights of black people. We need to end systemic racism in the police force and redistribute wealth to the people in this community that have been asking for it for decades. And I would assume since we decided that there is a housing crisis that some of these issues should take priority for you. I'm specifically reaching out to every single city council member in Bakersfield because you need to directly engage with communities, especially black and indigenous communities that are most at risk from police brutality, environmental disaster, decreased access to economic opportunities, and poor education systems. There is an and in the sentence. It's not just one thing. These are compounded problems that need solving right now. Poverty is not an abstract number. There are real people in our very real city that are experiencing poverty. Right now, that's over 19% of everybody in Bakersfield here. Almost one out of every five Bakersfield citizens is in poverty, which is the highest indicator of crime, right? I'm asking you to raise, rise to the call of restorative justice. Honor your vows as elected officials to fix these really real problems that are affecting our real community right now. Um, over the past two weeks, our city has shown its overwhelming support for defunding the BPD. It has made clear Thank through you. both physical and digital up. actions that Bakersfield must not use this money to fund an organization that has lost the accountability in the eyes of the national public. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. Mitchell Rowland, followed by Andrea. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> Thank you. 
Good evening, council members. I come to you tonight uh, both as a committee member of Measure N and also as a citizen of uh, Ward 5. It's my understanding that besides myself, other members of the Measure N committee have reached out to you in the last week to express their concern with this budget that you are addressing tonight and the proposal to hire 91 people with Measure N funds. Of course, the majority of those being police officers, I understand. But yet, not counting the police officers, there's a proposal to hire 49 people with Measure N funds, and those people's salary would be perpetually in the future paid for with Measure N funds. I also understand that the Current Taxpayers Association and the Bakersfield Chamber of Commerce have reached out to you with concerns about this budget that you are about to pass tonight or maybe are going to pass tonight. I encourage you to remember that you were elected by the people and that I understand you have to work with city staff, the city manager. I like Mr. Clegg. I have nothing against Mr. Clegg. I have nothing against city staff. But I want you to remember that when something comes before you that appears to be contradictory to what the majority of taxpayers and voters wanted, and city staff wants that, it's your duty as council people to represent the people that elected you and do what the citizens want, not what city staff wants. So I encourage you to make the uncomfortable decision tonight of rejecting the hiring of 49 non-sworn positions with Measure N funds and take a step back, look at this budget, maybe take another week to decide how to spend that money, but please listen to the citizens of Bakersfield, the Current Taxpayers Association, the Bakersfield Chamber of Commerce, and everybody that's telling you that they don't want their money spent that way. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Andrea. I am a student at CSU Bakersfield, and I am here because I am very outraged. I am so outraged that the community has to come here and basically explain ourselves why the police is a problem here in Kern County and why you should not approve this budget. Many of our community members have come here and given you stats about how bad it is here in Bakersfield, but we shouldn't have to. This is your city. You should know where funds should be allocated and where should they should not, and the police department is definitely not a place to allocate our funds. And also, what's up with all these city council individuals that are not wearing masks? Before we walked inside, everybody had to be wearing a mask, but some people in here are not. And that just proves us once more that not everybody in Bakersfield has the same spot. We're not treated equally and people are tired. We are tired of police brutality and we are tired of everything that's going on. And just listen to your crowds, listen to your people. People don't want the police budget to be approved like this. We need more funds in education, housing, and many other ways that it can better be used. Please listen to your community and don't be on the wrong side of history. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Tanya Burnell, Aneri Patel, and Anoki Patel. Thank you. First of all, I want to say that Black Lives Matter, and until Black Lives Matter, then no one's lives matter. Um, here in Kern County, we're number one in illiteracy, um, teen pregnancy. We have a huge homeless problem, yet we want to give 40% to uh, BPD, um, the same institution that continues to kill black and brown lives. Um, a 73-year-old man uh, by the name of Francisco um, was killed by BPD. Um, he had dementia. He was walking away. Um, but a white woman, she's afraid for her life, right? <laughs> so he's killed, right? A 19-year-old girl is mistaken by a 40-year-old man, 200 pounds, and she's attacked by a dog. This is what the BPD does. So if you pass the budget, you're telling the community that you don't give a <laughs> about black lives. Thank you. Next speaker, we're at 30 minutes, but we're going to go ahead and extend it another 30 minutes. So next speaker, please, and uh, the following one, please. 
Aneri Patel, Anoki Patel, and Adrian es Escanias. Hello, my name is Aneri Patel. I want everyone who's up there to look me in the eyes. Ward one, please get off your phone and look me in the eyes. Thank you. I want everyone here to understand that all the people behind me, the people in the lobbies and the people outside and the people that have been protesting for almost a few weeks now after George Floyd's death, another man named Robert Forbes was killed. I specifically tried to reach out to many of the council members that are sitting up here today and they blatantly ignored me. You know who you are. You need to make change. I don't want to give up any more time because I, we can see that time is limited, but I want you to go home and remember that you are sleeping peacefully tonight. Most of the people that are out there and the people that are in the lobby, so they're afraid that their kids won't come home. You know that? You don't feel bad, you know? That you're increasing the budget to kill more people? Those lives will be on your hand. Do you understand that? These lives matter. Black lives matter. You know that? These communities, these people. It, just, it clearly shows that you guys lack empathy. And I want you all that are, look me in the eyes, please. Ward one, ward two. Look me in the eyes. Thank you. OK, we can keep it peaceful in here, just like we've been keeping it peaceful outside for Go a few ahead. weeks. Now I'd like to address the next caller, please. Thank you, and sleep peacefully tonight. Don't forget it. Thank you. Next speaker, please. I'm going to keep this nice and short so the, all the other people that want to say something Welcome. can also say something. First of all, I want to start by saying thank you to every activist, every community member, and every individual that came out today to make their voices heard, whether they're in this room, in that lobby, or outside. Have you ever seen this many people come out for a city council meeting? Because I sure as hell not. So I want you to take that into consideration when you're deciding your budget today. Think about all the people that are here to make you listen, that are taking time out of our days to try to convince you that our lives matter. Now let's start with the budget. All right, according to the KGET 17, the Bakersfield City Council received over 2,000 emails and phone calls to defund the Bakersfield Police Department, but we haven't, had any res we haven't heard any response. We know this, you know this, because you haven't responded, and the public will has never been stronger for a cause, so why won't you listen? That's a real question. Why won't you respond? Don't say it's too late you can postpone this meeting. Don't say it's too hard because that's your job that we elected you for. And don't say that it won't work because we're seeing it work in other places in other cities, Fresno for example. We have what feels like a once in a lifetime, hi there, oh wait, don't worry. We have what feels like a once in a lifetime chance to make a change. And if you don't want to do your job and listen to the people that I'm going to politely ask, resign. There are hundreds of young people out there who are willing and wanting to replace you, who are willing and wanting to serve their communities, who are willing and wanting to not stay silent when <laughs> happens. If you can't handle that, then quit your job. If you can't represent the people of Bakersfield, then quit your job. If you don't want to do the hard work, we're not asking you to. Just leave. There's tons of people who want to replace you if it's too hard for you. What we are asking is that you can do your job, you do listen, and you take into consideration all the voices, all the people that are here. I'm just going to repeat what everyone else is saying, because guess what? We all feel the same thing. And if we all feel the same thing, we probably are in agreement that we should do something. And if you don't want to listen to it, that's your fault. All I'm here to say is defund the police, Refund our schools, refund our parks, refund our mental health services, refund substance abuse, help homeless people. Why is it that the Bakersfield City, why is it that the Bakersfield City Council is allocating 41% of its annual budget to the police department? You know what? That's more than the schools, the parks, and all our other infrastructure projects combined. That's outrageous. You don't see that? I hope you see that. All I'm asking is you do your job. And if you can't do your job, quit your job. Because there's tons of people here that have created a coalition that are putting in hours that they're not being paid for like you guys to create a budget that represents what they want. And if you can't see that, then you know what to do. You know where to resign. Defund the police, refund our communities, and Black Lives Matter. 
Thank you. We're going to take a five-minute bre uh, minute break. It's been requested, so we'll just step out right now and come back at 6.30. Thank you. All right, so I am assuming that we have uh, our three other council members online, and we are going to keep moving ahead. So, Madam Clerk, next speaker, please. Adrian S. Canias and Crystal Rains. Okay, thank you. And somebody just help me who's keeping time. Um, what's the end of this cutoff period? Madam City Attorney, were you watching on that? Uh, my understanding, Mayor, is that the cutoff time would be 645 plus the mm -hmm. time that we just took for the break. Um, so 50. that would be um, 650. Okay, thank you. There are quite a few people who still want to speak, so we're just going to ask you to be respectful of that, but welcome. Before I begin, I'd like to uh, thank everyone, uh, the supporters of the Black Lives Matter movement for being here, as well as everyone who came to speak their piece, as well as the honest, hardworking members of our police department and all our council members who would love to see change. Thank you. Please Without introduce me. yourself. My name is Adrian Escavius. I'm a lifelong citizen, current member of Ward 6. Hello, Council Member Sullivan, and a career-long educator. Um, I'd like to begin by saying that um, in 1999, I was seven years old. My next-door neighbor was a Sheriff's Department member. He allowed us to go ahead and cause mayhem and mischief across the board in our neighborhood. Um, however, when it was that one black kid in my neighborhood, it seemed to be an issue no matter what it was, even if he was playing basketball. Um, the year is 2001. My mother's abuser um, is being interrogated by the Bakersfield Police Department. Um, they take my eyewitness accounts. Um, nothing is ever done about that. The year is 2003, and I'm with a friend of mine who is a bit of an arsonist. He's changed now. However, when the fire department comes by, everything's hunky-dory. However, when the sheriff's department comes by, that's when things change. That's when they pin me against the wall, even though I had nothing to do with it. The year is 2008, and my then-current girlfriend, who, his father is actually a judge, says she doesn't need to worry about any speed tickings or anything like that, because, hey, daddy's a judge. Now, with all that being said, I want you to tell me, do we live in a tiered society? Or are we all going to live and abide by the American principles? Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Hello, Mayor Karen Gill and City Council. My name is Crystal Rains, and I'm the ASI Vice President of Legislative Affairs at CSUB. I'm a Ward 1, Bakersfield, born and raised, first generation Filipino American. I'm here because of the black and brown community that has shown me love and made me the woman who I am today. I'm here to question why we are considering to fund so much of the budget to a police that the ACLU says has engaged in patterns of excessive force, including shooting and beating to death unarmed individuals and deploying canines to attack and injure, as well as practice of filing intimidating or retaliatory criminal charges against individuals they subject to excessive force. We need to divest from a corrupt police force that believe that it is, quote, better financially to kill people. Just reforming it won't cut it. I believe strongly that we need to put that money into mental health and food insecurity and not police, homelessness resources, and even youth athletics like that first speaker said before. In America, we don't bat an eye when higher education funding is cut again and again. And why is that? It is not too late to make amendments to this budget. When a crisis happens, people respond. Strong people who listen to their constituents respond. For example, Kern County was able to secure millions for its public health department because of the COVID-19 crisis. And racism perpetuated by its police is absolutely a crisis that has been affecting Bakersfield since its inception. Council members, please listen to your constituents. Not only is the city watching this meeting, but the entire nation. We are loud and clear. Bakersfield black and brown lives matter. And we'll see you this November. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. We have about 14 people that still want to speak. We have about 14 le uh, minutes left. Madam Clerk, next speaker, please. Suzanne Wade, Traco Matthews, and Isaiah Crompton. Thank you. First speaker.
Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Suzanne Wade. My council member Freeman, I notice, isn't here anymore. That doesn't surprise me. He wasn't at the protest. He didn't come out and speak with us. He hasn't responded to my phone call. He has not responded to my email. Neither of you, Mayor Go. Hey. Councilmember Gonzalez is the only member who has been present at one of our protests. He is the only one who has come out and said Black Lives Matter. Karen Go came out. She came out during a eight minutes and 46 seconds of silence that was supposed to be held in honor of George Floyd. And then afterwards, she took the megaphone and she said, you know, the only thing I could hear was the flapping of a flag. We're all Americans and we should be united. That's just another way of saying all lives matter. Say black lives matter. Say it. Defund the police. Show it with your budget. The budget is a moral document. We need housing. We need mental health. You need to be listening to Dalton. You need to be listening to Taya. You need to be listening to Fahima. These are extremely educated people who have given so much time to create these resources for you. You could read them. Educate yourselves. Read a book. Or we could spend the money in the budget so that we could increase Bakersfield literacy, so we could help our schools, so that people aren't starting, so they don't come into school already behind. I'm a student teacher. Liberation and equality should be at the forefront of education. And if our education, if our schools aren't saying that, then they're just still upholding white supremacy. Black students are more likely to be suspended. This is where the prison pipeline starts. It's been really hard being out there. It is really hard to hear all this, but you need to come out and talk to these people. They are so smart. They have been so kind to me. Even though it is not their job, it is not, we shouldn't be making these people do emotional labor for us. We have to be better. We have to be smarter. We have to be educated. They shouldn't have to come up here and tell you these statistics. You should know the, what the ACLU says. You should know that the Bakersfield Police Department has been under investigation by the Department of Justice for the last three years. You should know what, what, you should know what Donnie Youngblood has said when he said that in response to homelessness, he was going to increase minimum incarceration for drug offenses? He said he was going to increase incarceration to help homelessness? That's what you want to put your money into, the police department, not into housing. For those of you who want to pray and speak of Jesus, faith without works is dead. If you believe in Jesus, you believe in helping the poor. You believe in helping the sick. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And just so you all know, you might not have heard Councilmember Freeman, Councilmember Smith, and Councilmember Weir are on the phone and at this meeting. Next speaker, please. Traco Matthews, Isaiah Crompton, and Michael Turnipseed. Mr. Matthews? Traco Matthews, uh, Traco, are you out in the lobby? Can somebody back there just check, please? Uh, let's go on to Isaiah Crompton, and then we'll check on Mr. Matthews, and then come back. Uh, Isaiah, had to leave. Isaiah had to leave? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll hold Traco, and then Mr. Turnipseed next, please. Madam Chair, members of the Council, Michael Turnipseed representing the Kern County Taxpayers Association. I just want to review a little history with you. Um, Back in April of 18, your former city manager came to our board meeting at Kern Tax pleading with us to support Measure N because of the financial difficulties of the city. The next month, we drafted a letter to you, the council, and staff on May 18th, laying four simple things that we wanted. Accountability, transparency. On June the 14th, an email which I provided each of you, Alan said, agreed. We thought we had a deal. Oh, 
but the ordinances weren't drafted. None of those things happened. And by that election time, Measure N has been nothing more than another ordinary budget process for you where staff comes up with the staff wants and the community who has needs have been unable to comment. This is broken promises. You're the council, you were here when this all happened, you're here today. And people are upset when you break your promises. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, is Mr. Matthews out there? Have we located him? Okay, he's not here, so uh, can you go ahead and announce the next, please? Oh, no, I was wrong. Really sorry. David Abbasi, Christina Gonzalez, and Kevin Burton. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Good evening. My name is David Abbasi. I'm a former candidate for Kern County Supervisor District 5 and a resident of Ward 2. I'm a native of Bakersfield and I love my hometown. Measure N was born in secrecy. This council had discussed and approved Measure N during closed session in violation of the Brown Act law. Now, it somehow passed even though it initially failed, but regardless, voters did not want a large portion of this money to be spent militarizing our police. The Bakersfield Police Department has been plagued with corruption. Our assistant chief beat and tried to rape his ex-wife. These are the people terrorizing our community. These are the ones taking bribes, kickbacks, and falsifying reports at the highest levels, according to Officer Chris Messick. Andy Gonzalez, he's just given us lip service. He's not doing anything about the brutality and the misconduct. He's too busy with the rest of you uh, have with your backroom deals creating um, pay for pay for play cannabis permits with Philip Ganonk. Listen, uh, we're not asking you to get rid of police and eliminate them. We're asking you to decrease the overinflated budget and direct some of those funds to community needs. Uh, we need some reform and we need some, um, some changes. So please uh, follow the people's budget recommendations and defund the police. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Christina Gonzalez, Kevin Burton, and Terry Maxwell. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Go ahead and lower the mic. Good afternoon. My name is Christina Gonzalez. Um, the reason that I'm here tonight is because um, I believe that we have too much funding going to our police departments and we have other areas in our community that are suffering. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and I work with moderate to high risk offenders in our community who have drug problems and who have mental health disorders. And I have seen time and time again that their mental health disorders are criminalized. Their lives are ruined for something that they cannot control. It's just as somebody having diabetes. Would you criminalize somebody for having diabetes? Um, I enjoy the work that I do. And I 100% stand behind um, making other people's lives better. I'm not saying, and I'm not standing here saying that we do not need police. I'm not against them. But I do believe there is a culture problem within their department. Um, these last couple of weeks I have seen in the media with uh, the Sheriff's Department and BPD, um, the chief, and they've been very attentive to the community and their concerns. The most I've ever seen, and I lived here my whole life. But yet when it comes down to officer-involved shootings or beatings, they're nowhere to be found. Nowhere. When we have police departments, they are supposed to be working with the public. 
you're not supposed to be hiding anything. You're not supposed to be covering up anything. You're supposed to be transparent. You cannot have a relationship without trust. And that is what this city is lacking with our law enforcement. That is trust. Thank you for letting me talk. Thank you. We have four more speakers in about four more minutes. Uh, next speaker, please, Madam Clerk. Kevin Burton, Terry Maxwell, and we have one last speaker. Welcome. Please. Honorable Mayor Go and City Council members. Kevin Burton, I am chair of Kern Tax. All of you have received a letter from Kern Tax regarding Measure N. I was on the committee with Measure N to help work through the needs of this community. Every single one of you know what the needs were. We've addressed that. We've sent out also the emails and the confirmations through Barry Hibbard with then city manager Alan Tandy. We would like for you to really take a look at what we presented that we come together and we work to work these things out and stop spending money foolishly on items that were not promoted and marketed for the public to vote on for measure in. We have 50 to $60 million. We know how important that money is of the city. We know how important it is what the taxpayers paid Remember, we vote the city council members in, county supervisors, assembly members, state senators, and the Congress and the U.S. Senate. We trust you with our checkbook. It's our money. We voted for this. We want to make sure that the funding goes to the priorities of what the taxpayers wanted. So please reach out. I know the I know the Bakersfield Chamber, Nick Ortiz has reached out, and I know others. Let's work together. Let's make this happen. And let's make the city top level. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Terry Maxwell, and then there's one uh, last speaker. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Good evening, uh, Mary Go, council members. My name is Terry Maxwell, and uh, at first I wasn't gonna come down here and, and uh, make any statement, but uh, five years ago I uh, was up on the dais where uh, council member Gonzalez sits, and uh, I made the statement that I felt that the city of Bakersfield needed 100 more police officers. When you compared us demographically to cities like Wichita, Kansas, and uh, a few other places, uh, like in Colorado and the Texas, uh, we were at least 100 to 150 police officers depleted over what they had. Uh, as I say, their demographics, as well as our geographic area, was about the same. At that time, uh, I was ridiculed and laughed at for such a statement, that Bakersfield certainly had plenty of police officers, and, and we, uh, I also said that we uh, had a problem with homelessness. Here it is five years later, and of course, we did need those 100 police officers. We probably need more than that. And uh, this budget is going to be a tough one. Uh, as you all know, the economy in Bakersfield is, is really up in the air. Uh, I was pleased to see that the, the city manager has promised to come back uh, very, very quickly and timely and often to let you know exactly what's going on with the budget because you're going to probably be, be faced with cutting out some of the things that we really don't need. But I would assure you that as far as people my age are concerned, uh, we do want to live in safe neighborhoods. We do want to be able to, you know, have a, a, uh, a place where our family can, can play, can do things that, that are what everybody dreams of. And I would, uh, I would think that the money that you're going to be spending is going to have to be prioritized this year. Um, 
it's no secret that there are some that are, are not agreeing with what I'm saying. But again, I represent a certain group of people in this community, and we do expect that we'll have a police, police force. I know a lot of these guys on the police force. They're outstanding individuals. I've known the past, past police chief. I know this police chief. They're great people. They're great people, they're great leaders. And uh, I would hope that uh, as the budget does not perform the way that you're hoping, that you will continue to keep this neighbor neighborhood safe and our community safe. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mayor, I apologize. We have two final speakers, Joey Fielding and then one last speaker. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Fielding, is Joey Fielding in the lobby? Uh, officer, some, can you just check on Mr. Fielding? And let's go ahead and have the, next, the final speaker. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you announce that person, please? Okay, go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, uh, hi, my name is Nicholas, and I'd like to uh, speak on behalf of the budget as well. Along with Mr. Maxwell, I didn't have the intention of coming here to speak tonight, and I actually was kind of outraged by the mob mentality which has taken over our city uh, and especially our city council meeting tonight and I wanted to speak on behalf of the businesses in Bakersfield, California which get vandalized multiple times, thousands of times throughout the year and those costs drive up the overall amount that these businesses can reinvest into their communities and with the protection of the police department which gets stuck writing long, long reports on very, very small things as opposed to getting back and protecting these businesses and the community as well. So these businesses invest in their communities with the hopes of future payoff through decreased crime and also increased educa education of the individuals in the communities. I hear cries of this mob of tearing down the establishment instead of building upon what we have already. The tearing down, which was something which was built by the people of this community, the businesses which funded everything which we have, should not be taken small. We should also appreciate everything which we have come from. Money by individuals and businesses fund the city and without protection, people are in fear. Without proper protection, people will begin taking matters into their own hands, causing chaos. Businesses don't wish to do this. Businesses want to be protected by their city. The police defunding it is not the solution. Policing and protecting our community and our businesses, which fund us, need to be protected. Money doesn't grow on trees. I understand that. I don't believe that this money should just be going to pet projects of a mob. There's a majority of people who fear to speak. And these, these individuals, they don't wish to let that, those people speak. They fear for their lives. The loudest group isn't the one to be heard only. The silent group also needs to be heard the businesses, the individuals. We want to be protected. I'm not saying that the police are all, all good. Sure, where is there something in business? There are bad apple businesses, but you can't judge an establishment off of the two bad things. At the end of the day, we must find a solution and build upon what we have. Thank, Thank you. you. And Madam Clerk, is there one, is, is it Mr. Fielding? Yes, yes Madam. Okay, Mr. and Fielding. you're the final speaker, and we've already gone over time, so if you could just share with us as succinctly as possible, please. Sure, I will be brief. I just want to say, how dare you? How dare you put the responsibility on these black and brown individuals outside who are screaming in pain because of their family members who are dying in the streets? I know you all are afraid. That's why there are so many of these murderers that are here staring at us right now. But when you go home, you're gonna go home to a different side of town than they are. 
and they're going to go home to where these murderers patrol. How dare you? Thank you. And thank you all for sharing, and that concludes our public comments. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Okay, uh, Under consent calendar, we have consent calendar items 8A through 8AW for approval. We have received a staff memorandum regarding item 8H, transmitting email and voicemail correspondence. Okay. Uh, let's take a five minute break. Thank you. Uh, let's continue. So we are, uh, Madam Clerk, go ahead and announce the agenda item again, please. Certainly. Consent calendar items 8A through 8AW for approval. We have received a staff memorandum transmitting correspondence for item 8H. Vice Mayor. Does any council member wish to recuse themselves from an item? Does any council member wish to remove a consent item for separate consideration? Yes. Yes. Is Bruce? Uh, Pardon me? It's Ken. Okay, Ken. What do you have? Let, let, let Bruce go first. Bruce. Well, Bruce has uh, stated that he would like to remove item H2. Oh, okay. I'm and, good with that. And I'm sorry, can you speak up a little bit? I'm good with that. That's, that's fine. Okay. I, I don't need to remove anything else. So I'd like to make a motion that we approve consent calendar items 8A through 8AW with the exception of H2, along with the noted agenda corrections by the city clerk. Thank you. So uh, you have a motion. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Vice Mayor Parlier. Aye. Councilmember Rivera. Aye. Councilmember Gonzalez. Aye. Councilmember Weir. Aye. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Freeman? Aye. And Councilmember Sullivan? Here. Aye. Motion is unanimously approved. And so now H2, Councilmember Freeman? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, we really can't hear you. Can you move the uh, increase the volume, please, uh, Madam Clerk? Councilmember Freeman, go ahead and just let's test the volume. Uh, yeah, I wanted to make a few comments because um, we've received um, a legal analysis from uh, Ms. Gennaro, which uh, was very thorough and, uh, and convincing, and we've received a legal analysis from Ms. Goldner, which is also very thorough and very convincing. We have a couple of really smart ladies uh, <laughs> which, you know, makes it a bit confusing, uh, but, but both are articulate and make strong cases. Um, Ms. Gennaro seemed to put the weight of her argument more on past precedent and the fact that if there's sort of a tie in an interpretation, it, 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 it might go to a charter city in a dispute like this if it ever came to, you know, actual litigation. Uh, Ms. Goldner, at least from my layman's reading, seems to rely more on the letter of the law. Um, but I really want to avoid litigation. <laughs> uh, I think that, um, you know, there, our job is to find compromises to work things out. And I've been trying to think of a solution that is imperfect like they all are, but can move us forward. And I, I believe it's critical that we hold a special election uh, for Ward 1 this fall, uh, wrap it in the general election, uh, so we get a new council member for Ward 1 because council member Rivera is resigning. So I figure that's probably the most important thing we're dealing with. We, we need to be able to do that. Um, I think 
you know, it, this would have been cleaner. The dispute seems to be about whether you can, uh, you know, if you've resigned or not, if you give a forward date without actually resigning now, there's a dispute between the attorneys on that. Uh, wish we didn't have that. Uh, Council Member Rivera wants to continue. Um, be simpler if he didn't, but that's his right to do that. So um, here we are in, a, in an imperfect situation. Um, but I would, I was trying to find a way that we can move forward. I think the most important thing is to get this election award one done. And I won't say it's not important, but it's of lesser important who the representative is for Ward 1 for the next six months. Uh, and that's not casting aspersions on Councilman Rivera or anyone who might have been appointed. Just, I think, whether it's Councilman Rivera or an appointee is, is uh, not unimportant, but less important than we've got to move forward on this uh, election. Uh, so I'd like to propose a, uh, a compromise motion uh, that at least I could support. Uh, so here's what I would ask the council to consider. Uh, I would make a motion to approve the staff's recommendation to hold a special election for Ward 1 this coming fall. Um, it would be, though, provided that Councilman Rivera will give us a specific date for his resignation. Let's say within a month, by July 24, 30 days from now, just tell us what the date will be. And that said date would be before the date of the actual election. Uh, that's November 6th or something like that. Uh, I, think that I think that helps if, uh, if he would work with us on that so we don't so we have an election, we don't have any issue of, is there a councilman there while we're having an election? Just that all the way up, I don't know, it's November 6th. Uh, and I'd like to add something to this so that we don't ever have a dispute like this again. And, you know, I don't want potential litigation. I don't want to spend legal fees. Uh, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars if somebody sues us. Uh, I know we've done it, this has happened in the past, not the lawsuit, we've had these, you know, these type of situations, but now we have, you know, kind of a brouhaha legally. I just don't want to go through it again. So I would add to my resolution that the council will agree that in the future, whenever a council person resigns prior to the end of his or her term, it must be on a date certain, and the date must be prior to the date that candidates for his or her replacement in a, in a special election, have to pull papers to run for the council seat. That, that way, we won't have to have these disputes next time this goes around, because it'll probably happen again. Uh, but that's why try, I'm trying to compromise, get the important things done now, and avoid, at least avoid, us having to deal with this in the future. So I would like other council members to comment on uh, on this before it's put to a vote. Council Member Freeman, is that the conclusion of your? Yeah, those, that's Thank my you. comment, is to offer that compromise. Uh, City Attorney, do you wish to comment at all at this point? Uh, no, not at this time, Mayor. I'll listen to the rest of the council members. Okay, thank you. Council Member Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Bruce, there was a distraction. I wasn't able to hear that last part. So I do have a question. Um, I'm very open to, and I appreciate you coming up with something that's going to, to make us all comfortable in supporting uh, what I, I feel Willie was wanting to accomplish. And, and uh, um, I, I feel that he was wanting to help, and certainly Jenny, we have great confidence in Jenny. Uh, but Bruce, now, did you say for um, Willie's reg reg um, resignation to be at a date before the election or before 
the the pulling of the uh, the time to pull papers I know. that I, I didn't hear before the day of the election okay that's what i thought that's to begin with election. you said it was I because see. we've heard you know there's a I mean, there's a lot of issues but one might be gee the council wasn't seat wasn't vacant when you held an election mm -hmm. well that would solve that problem mm -hmm. i see yeah sounds great appreciate coming up with something that's going to solve our problem and uh, okay thank you friends making that clear thank you council member sullivan are there any other council members who wish to speak at this time and council members who are on the phone if you can just uh, let the clerk know and somebody will hold up something so i'll know so council member rivera next please thank you mayor um so i i do think it's important that we get uh the thoughts of the attorney we actually employee um, and that's that's Miss Gennaro it's not Miss Goldner so um, I know I've had conversations with you I've looked through your memo um, and and I think you did a thorough job of, of answering this question but but I would like you uh, to actually go through for for the full council um, what your analysis showed um, and uh, what your thoughts are um, as it relates to this particular resolution as it stands right now. And then I'd like to comment after. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilman uh, Rivera, again, I think the admin report sets forth the analysis. I will go through it very briefly. Um, but in essence, what the reason we came up with, with the proposal before you tonight is that your charter indicates what happens when a council member vacates the seat with more than six months remaining on his or her term, and that's exactly what you're proposing to do. The key issue, however, is that our charter does not indicate what a vacancy is. And um, when our charter doesn't indicate uh, what a vacancy is, or there may be other issues with our charter, uh, where it's silent, then we look to other areas of the law. And in this particular case, then we look to the government code as to what a vacancy is. And that section of the government code that is quoted, which is government code section 1770, it specifically says that an office becomes vacant on the happening of any of the following events. And one of the events that the government code indicates is a happening is in the case of the office of a city council member upon the delivery of a letter of resignation by the resigning council member to the city clerk. And that letter of resignation may specify a date on which the resignation will become effective. So I believe that not only does the government code um, support the conclusion that your seat is vacant because you delivered that irrevocable notice of intent to vacate, um, but we also actually um, have a case that came out in 2012, and we recently found it, and it was actually out of the city of Watsonville. Um, and that superior court judge uh, there in that particular case also cited the exact same section that I just read um, to the mayor and the council. Uh, so I feel confident that that irrevocable notice of intent to vacate is a vacancy. Uh, the issue then becomes uh, what does the council want to do? Uh, do you want to call a special election um, or do you want to require the citizens in Ward 1 to circulate the petition um, and then you will have to go through the cost of verifying those petitions, verifying those signatures, et cetera, um, and you will probably not meet the November date uh, because that is going to require a tremendous amount of resource to, uh, to accomplish. I would also indicate to you that, again, the last date to really do what is being suggested is tonight um, because the law indicates that the last date we can consolidate, according to um, Mr. Marcus, is July 14th, and your next meeting is on July 15th, and that is the 88th day prior to the general election, and the code says you need to have that, um, you need to have that consolidation prior to that time. So, Councilman Rivera and uh, Mayor and the rest of the council, I hope I've at least given you some type of insight into the analysis. If you have any further questions, I'm certainly open to address those. Thank you, Madam City Attorney. Councilmember Rivera. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, thank you, Jenny. I mean, I, th I think your research and I think um, 
your memo quite clearly spells out um, the process as we're taking it as completely and entirely legal. Um, I've got another question for you because um, I think you heard Council Member, I heard Council Member Freeman say that um, I think one of the, the chief reasons um, this resolution was on the agenda as it was was because of past practice. Um, I'm hearing obviously uh, that the law is actually quite clear. I've read it. I don't know if Mr. Freeman has. Um, but do you think, uh, to his point, as it relates to avoiding litigation, um, and as an attorney, I'm sure you can appreciate this, but is it ever possible to 100% uh, 100%, 100 uh, spell out or prevent yourself from exposure of litigation, whether it's for wearing the wrong hat or the wrong color t-shirt or doing something else? Can't you always be sued for something? Councilman Rivera, Mayor, members of the council, I think you know the answer to that. I mean, obviously, we live in one of the most, if not the most litigious state in the United States. And so certainly, um, there's always the risk of litigation. And I, and I think, as I mentioned to you, even the scenario before you tonight um, has some risks. But as your city attorney, again, I believe that we have some solid arguments in its defense. Um, and that's, again, that's one of the reasons why it's before you tonight. Thank you, Jenny. Um, uh, so given, given all of that and the fact that uh, Council Member Freeman did not um, have a conversation with me prior to this evening about um, uh, his suggested course of action, which I certainly would have appreciated, um, I'm, I'm not inclined to um, acquiesce to a resignation on, uh, uh, on his terms. Um, I think uh, the letter I've submitted to this council was very clear. Um, it was a letter submitted based on uh, past, uh, past letters submitted. Um, it, uh, in my interpretation and based on what I'm hearing from our attorney, uh, met all the requirements of the law and I do not believe that there's any reason to uh, change course, uh, you know, our course of action based on uh, one uh, attorney um, and one letter we received suggesting we do something differently. So uh, with that, I would uh, actually move staff's uh, recommendation um, approving the resolution as it is in the agenda currently. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Smith has requested to speak followed by Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm, I'm in agreement with Councilman Rivera. When I first read the analysis by uh, Ms. Goldner, I, I did not agree with it. And, I, and the, the legal statement that, that she highlighted conflicted with what she said. And it was exactly the section that our attorney stated that a city council member can give notice and give a future date and that date becomes the date of vacancy and that makes all the sense in the world to me I'm not. he has given us a date and uh, that date is when a new council member gets sworn in i think that councilman rivera was elected by his ward twice and at least and the next person should be elected by the ward. And so I, I think that staff's recommendation makes the most sense. And again, the, the legal analysis that we got from the outside attorney uh, did not make sense to me from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. Councilmember Gonzalez next, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Freeman, I had a question for you. I wanted just to gain clarity. You, in your proposal then, uh, if Council Member Rivera had chosen to resign and given us a date, what would happen in between uh, that date and the date we seat the, the newly elected council member? Are you saying if he had, I'm not sure, if he, if he had resigned, when? If he had given us a date under your scenario, Oh, if he if he were to resign by the day before the election, let's say. Correct. And if he gave us, if he told us that 
would be the specific date sometime in the next 30 days. Um, that's all that would happen. I mean, they, I, I just were, I'm trying to protect us against litigation uh, on this issue because I, other than the city attorney, I am sure I've been in a hundred times more litigation than anybody else on this council. And you never know your chances are 50 50 when you go into that courtroom. Mm -hmm. No matter how good you Kate, think your case is, I've been there. <laughs> you, you never know what's going to come out of it. Yeah. So I'm not, I don't want anybody to sue the city over this. It ain't going to be me. But I don't want to have that risk that we would have to spend attorneys. And in the future, I would like to not go through this anymore because I think there's, you know, I think there's an issue. So I was trying to find a compromise yeah. that I thought everybody could live with with a little bit of bending here. Uh, I didn't think of it until about 45 minutes ago. I just thought of it. Uh, but um, I thought that could, number one, get us the election now. Let Council Rivera serve all the way to the day up to the election. Eliminate some of the areas that uh, have been criticized in this Goldner's, uh, Goldner's memos about no date certain and things like that. And I just thought it might help us, should we ever get sued, prevail. Uh, so those are my reasons, and uh, that's why I proposed it. Thank you, Councilmember Freeman. I would just say that it's problematic for me to have the seat representing Ward 1 vacant for 90 days uh, or any amount of time in between now and the next election. And I think that um, the people of Ward 1 deserve to elect their representative. And if we do face the risk of litigation, I'm willing to fight on the side of representation and democracy. So I support the motion made by my colleague, Councilmember Rivera. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez. Councilmember Sullivan next, please. Okay. <clears throat> Now, I'm understanding Bruce's, um, I mean, it would be great if we could find a compromise. I'm all for, for uh, uh, Council Member Rivera staying. He's been a great representative, wonderful to work with. And, uh, but now I'm understanding uh, Bruce to say that if, if, a, um, if Willie resigns just before the election, which, what would be the problem with that? To have one more layer of protection to, to eliminate the, 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 the chance of being sued, and I have complete confidence in our, in our city attorney, but to, just to cover all the bases, isn't that, uh, isn't that Bruce, what you're saying, that uh, if, if, if he um, will say to resign just before the election in November, is that correct? Yeah, it, it, there isn't a guarantee that the city would win should it get in litigation, but I think it's helpful. I think it's one more thing that would be helpful. And to me, that's, that's a, a simple enough uh, solution to, to relieve the, the concern, the, the, the concern that is being expressed. I, I don't think that's a problem. I would, uh, I would support that. It really is covering, it's giving us, it's, um, giving us the representation that we're used to, that, that we've had, and um, certainly wouldn't, don't want, I, it's certainly not necessary. I would not want um, you to resign any sooner and have to appoint or any of that. Not at all interested in that, but it seems to be a good, a good solution, so. I'm interested to hear what else is being thought of. Thank you, Councilmember Sullivan. Uh, <clears throat> Madam City Attorney, did you want to comment? Oh. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I would just note, while I do deeply appreciate Councilmember Freeman's desire to come up to a compromise, I think it bears disclosing that, number one, I don't think any of us can force Councilman Rivera to resign on a specific date. I don't think Councilman Freeman is asking that. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think that while I have not talked to Ms. Goldner, I think it's very clear from the reading of Ms. Goldner's letter 
that that compromise being uh, put out in front of us by Councilman Freeman doesn't, doesn't uh, eliminate the risk. In fact, if anything, I would tell you it elevates the risk. Why? Because Ms. Goldner's letter is saying that you as the council, that you don't have the power to call for a special election because that seat's not vacant. So his, his, Councilman Rivera's seat under the proposal by Councilman Freeman wouldn't be vacant until before the election. So that risk of litigation is there in, in her letter. So again, I think that the historic way that we have handled this, we have not seen any, um, any, uh, any lawsuits before uh, handling it the way that, that we've continued to do it. It offers, as Councilman Gonzalez indicates, it offers the democratic process, and courts are very, very reluctant to set aside uh, the results of an election, which is what you would be doing tonight. Thank you. Any other comments? No. I don't see any other. No. Uh, Councilmember Rivera. Oh. Hello? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilmember Weir. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So, you know, I thought a lot about this and I talked to Willie about this and I, I understand what Willie wants to do and I think his heart is in the right place. Um, but I've also had um, the opportunity to review other council from other attorneys on this and actually it it makes me uncomfortable to go through with the process like this it, it just makes me uncomfortable i i read jenny's work and you know it it certainly is uh, very straightforward but i i've had privy to other information and it it makes me really kind of doubt what we're doing right now so um, hey, but I would agree with Bruce on one thing. We probably should um, try after this is all done to make it much more clear on what the process and the procedure is to do this so we don't end up in a situation. Um, so I think it makes, makes me uncomfortable and I don't know about the rest of the councilmen, but um, it, it certainly should be spelled out I think in a little bit more detailed manner. Um, so that's all I have to say. I'm I'm very uncomfortable with moving forward with this, but the will of the council will prevail. So thank you, thank Council you. Member Weir. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? I don't see any requests. Uh, yes, I had my hand up. <laughs> uh, can you, City Attorney, can you please indicate to me because I I cannot see whatever you're looking at. Uh, uh, city Please. Clerk, sorry. Uh, yes, Councilmember Freeman. Um, uh, yeah, two things. Uh, one, uh, I, I'm not sure I understood uh, Ms. Gennaro's comments that I would be asking people to set aside an election result. Uh, I'm trying to get us to have an election <laughs> and not have it set aside. And I agree with her. I don't think it would get set aside even if we had a lawsuit and, and we lost. Uh, I think we'd have some legal fees and get our hand slapped and tell us to change our ordinance, but I don't think we'd have a, an election set aside. Uh, but uh, I don't know where that comment came from. Um, and I also understand that if Councilman Rivera, uh, let's say if my if my motion were to pass and and uh, he says he, 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 he still, you know, whatever reason that won't go along with it, then I know that that becomes kind of moot. My, we can't do anything with it because it does require cooperation. Uh, so I, I, I know that full well. I'd like to see where it turns out. And then, you know, the council's will will ultimately prevail. Thank you, Council Member Freeman. Is there, anybody, is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Seeing none. So. Council Member Sullivan. Okay, go ahead and press just, your just button. To, right, thank you. Oh, sorry, I thought it was pushed. Okay, so actually what we would be doing, um, everything would be going as we have been planning for it to go or expecting it to go, but yet 
uh, just before the election, then um, if if Willie was to um, was to resign, then are you saying um, okay? So Bruce, you're saying that that would solve your problem. That would make things better for you, and that would be the compromise that you it, would, it would hope that we would agree with. The answer: It would make me more comfortable. It's certainly not litigation proof. Um, I, I'm trying to get us to not be sued. <laughs> uh, I don't really understand the comment that that if if my and I'd like this year to explain if if the council were were to adopt my proposal, we're saying that the uh, the election results would be set aside. I don't see how that follows. Madam City Attorney. Sure. Thank you, Councilmember Freeman. No, what I what I was indicating by that, Councilmember Freeman, is that we have at least one opponent to this, Ms. Goldner, who was saying that you may not call the special election because there isn't a vacancy. So that argument would still exist um, under your hypothetical because the seat wouldn't be vacated under her analysis until Councilman Rivera stepped down. Okay, I understand that. Okay. I, 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 this is totally a gray area as all litigation is. Some, if we were sued, some judge gonna sit back there and weigh all the things that everybody did and look at the efforts the council made to keep this legal. And they're gonna, that person, him or will, makes a totally subjective decision. That's what judges do. Is they, in the end, they kind of say, well, what do I feel when I've heard all these things? So I was simply trying to make us look like we've been over backwards to make it as legal and accommodating as possible, although certainly not perfect. Understood. You, and understood. And I also think, again, your uh, suggestion as well as Council Member Weir's suggestion that the council do something uh, to see if we can define vacancy uh, in our code would be an excellent idea and something that we should work on going forward and we can put that in an ordinance uh, in an ordinance format um, and that would provide some clarity moving forward okay well should my should my uh, motion fail uh, you have to do it tonight but I would like you to help us with that I, I would like us to do that understood Thank you, Councilmember Freeman. So now we will go ahead and vote on Councilmember Rivera's <coughs> motion. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Parlier. Aye. Councilmember Rivera. Aye. Councilmember Gonzalez. Aye. Councilmember Weir. Councilmember Weir, would you please unmute yourself? Hello? Councilmember Weir, would you cast your vote, please? Okay, I, I got disconnected, so I don't even know what I'm voting on. Which, oh, okay, this I, is Councilmember Rivera's motion to accept staff's recommendation. Um, okay, I abstain. Okay. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Freeman. Nay. Councilmember Sullivan. Nay. Motion is approved with Councilmember Weir abstaining, Councilmember Freeman voting no, and Councilmember Sullivan voting no. Thank you. All right, uh, Madam. Clerk, next item, please. Consent calendar, public hearings 9A through 9C for approval. Thank you. 
The purpose of this section, the consent calendar hearings, is to vote on all of the items listed under consent calendar hearing in one motion without further comment. If anyone would like to speak on any of the hearing items, the item must be removed from this portion of the agenda. If an item is removed, it will be placed at the end of the regular public hearing portion of the meeting. So at this time, I will open consent calendar public hearing items 9A through 9C. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to request that a hearing item be removed from the consent calendar? If so, please come forward. This isn't the time to take testimony, only to remove the matter from consent calendar hearing. Seeing none, does any council member wish to remove an item from the consent calendar hearing? Seeing none, at this time, consent calendar public hearing items 9A through 9C are now closed. Vice Mayor? Make a motion to approve Resolution consent calendar public hearing items A, B, and C. You have a motion? Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Parlier? Aye. Councilmember Rivera? Aye. Councilmember Gonzalez? Aye. Councilmember Weir? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Freeman? Aye. And Councilmember Sullivan. Aye. Motion is unanimously approved. Thank you. Uh, before we enter the next portion, I'm going to call for a five minute break and we'll be right back. Thank you. All right, let's reconvene. Uh, let's, how many council members are on the phone at this point? We have all three. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Madam City Clerk, would you please read the next item? Item 12, Deferred Business. Fiscal Year 2021 Budget. Resolution approving and adopting the operating and capital improvement budgets. Item 2, resolution establishing the City of Bakersfield appropriations limit. And item 3, approval of the publicly available pay schedule. Thank you, Mr. Clegg. Good evening, Madam Mayor and uh, members of the City Council. I understand from staff that this item sometimes um, is not a particularly lengthy presentation and by PowerPoint, um, but uh, trying to be responsive to considerable public interest in our budget this year. Um, we do have a number of slides, but also try and be efficient with uh, my time in going through those slides. Partly I wanted to put this um, in PowerPoint so it's there for the public record for uh, the public to review. And so some slides I may move through quickly because council is very familiar with, but again, it stands as public record. So just want to reflect uh, our budget process. Uh, this process typically begins very early in the year. We started in January. Uh, we uh, had requested departments to submit their budgets in um, mid-March. Because of COVID, of course, we had to pivot and it was a very constricted and challenging um, April and May to get a revi completely revised budget essentially uh, prepared for the city council. But we have had several uh, council uh, presentations uh, to um, uh, lengthy workshops with the city council, um, as well as uh, to uh, workshops or meetings with our oversight committee. And that brings us today to the 24th uh, for our budget adoption. Just wanna remind council that you know in May, I made some comments about, you know, this is a community that's in transition. Uh, there's been a lot of change in this community in recent years. Uh, there have been some significant ups and downs uh, that have been experienced here that have not been experienced in all cities in California. And so uh, there have been uh, several very challenging fiscal outlooks since the Great Recession. And it's only been in the last two years that the city's uh, been in a position to address much of that deferred investment in many areas. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about our prioritization framework, but it's around the city council goals, the measure and uh, priorities that have been established and also trying to help us think through recovery coming out of um, COVID-19. This is just a reminder uh, of your city council goals. The budget is crafted around these goals principally, 
but we also look at our PSVS, uh, our Measure N um, uh, 13 uh, priority statements. And I would reflect in fairness that um, a majority of uh, funds have gone to those uh, uh, top listed priorities in there, but also there have been significant investments in quality of life and, and uh, economic development uh, as well uh, that we'll cover through this presentation. Uh, I also just want to reflect that on May 6th, my um, commitment to this council is that I think that we need to invest in community and invest in quality of life, that our downtown and our urban neighborhoods uh, need to see renewal. Economic development is very important and that we continue to look at our infrastructure and our business-friendly approach, um, but that many of these quality of life issues have needed to be addressed for some time, and now is our opportunity through Measure N to do that. Uh, but at the same time, there's important opportunities to look at efficiencies uh, and uh, modernizations in this organization that can make us better and uh, bringing us into some 21st century best practices. Just want to point out uh, some key uh, uh, topics. The budget is balanced. Um, uh, they reflect the city council goals and community priorities. Uh, I would submit that it is very consistent with the city council uh, goals and the priorities uh, that I've heard from the community uh, through um, many different uh, uh, sources. Um, of course, we have looked at our revenue losses that we anticipate, and they will be significant. We've covered that with council. Um, it reflects a larger percent decrease even than we saw in the Great Recession. We are also assuming that we will receive reimbursement funds from CARES. Uh, we're confident that we'll achieve that, but know that um, we'll have to work at that. Um, and that in our general fund, uh, outside of the public safety and vital services, that there has you know, been no additions to discretionary spending because of the budget uh, deficit on the general fund, given our uh, reduction in uh, revenues. Um, however, uh, you know, we are uniquely positioned in Bakersfield that because of public safety and vital services measure, we can make some targeted investments, uh, not as much as we had hoped to. Um, we'll speak to that more a little bit later, but the focus has been on public safety, economic development, economic recovery, and that quality of life. We have continued funding of core infrastructure that's been deferred as well as those neighborhood enhancements that um, I feel um, the community has been asking for through Measure N. Uh, it also prioritizes, though, contingency and reserves because we wanted to be very cautious and also our long-term fiscal sustainability. So speaking to some of that fiscal prudence, on the general fund side, we have had a hiring freeze since March um, and our, we've done significant measures to control our discretionary um, costs and we will have hiring uh, p uh, freeze continue into this new fiscal year. We'll have several general fund positions that we uh, do not fill um, to make sure that we are cautious and, and maintain that balanced budget. <coughs> On the public safety and vital services side, I uh, want to reflect, well, this is actually true of both our general fund, all funds, but in particular also our uh, PSVS. We've had a 10% reduction and in some areas even greater uh, than a 10% reduction in the amount of revenues that we're assuming. So we've already backed off how, how much we think we're going to receive. In addition to that, there are reserves and uh, contingency that's held uh, within PSVS, which represents about 13% of that budget. We've also created a list of capital projects, uh, seven, uh, just a little more than $7 million, that are contingent projects that we won't move on until uh, mid-year to, uh, to be certain that those revenues are going to be received. That's uh, a more than 10% of our budget. And then uh, we will have some fund balance in PSVS. We still have to calculate those particular uh, dollar amounts, but we estimate them to be close to another 10% of the budget. So if you reflect that we've already made a 10% reduction and we have a 30% contingency, that's a very conservative approach to our budget. Um, I've reflected on this a little bit already, uh, but uh, we, we can't, don't have as much funding to address all the things that we had, had hoped to for phase two of PSVS. Um, 
but I do want to let council know that you know each and every line item that's in the the PSVS budget was you know uh, done with purpose, um, and the framework for those again were the council goals, our priorities, uh, economic recovery, but it's also based on community need and our areas of greatest deferred investment. Uh, I I wanted to suggest here a, a, a few important thoughts about how we approach the PSVS budget. Um, you know, I, I would respectfully uh, point out that you know I was brought on as a city manager uh, to uh, manage the operations, um, and that I have a strong experience in uh, municipal budgeting, and I wouldn't make recommendations to the city council, uh, particularly in light of our fiscal conditions, if I didn't think that uh, they were important. Um, and trying to do our best to follow best practices, industry standards, and what would be typical costs uh, for doing city business. Um, but I also know that it's really important to listen to you, the city council, and the community in making these recommendations. And uh, it's, it's challenging to balance competing interests. Um, and I think even tonight has demonstrated that there are some uh, you know, different perspectives on how to use uh, city funding. So uh, we came at this budget trying to balance those different interests. Uh, I would suggest to you that uh, we listened very closely to the comments of the Oversight Committee. Um, I actually reached out to each of the members of the Oversight Committee before we even had our meetings and, and tried to bring forward those ideas and projects that uh, were reflective of the things that they talked about. We again looked closely at the Council goals. Uh, we've listened closely to the community voices in our workshops and our public hearings. Um, and in addition, um, uh, very recently, I would uh, reflect to the council that city staff has reviewed the, the people's um, budget Bakersfield. We've reviewed the materials that they've um, put out there um, on their website and looked closely at the things that they're recommending funding be allocated towards. Um, and uh, I would suggest that our budget in many areas is actually very well aligned with the recommendations that are being made. And I make a commitment to the members of the community to be willing to walk through in detail uh, how our budget is responsive to uh, the many interests that have been expressed. Um, and I'll just give a few examples really quickly before uh, diving into you know, some of our uh, other materials. It's, it's not just how much funding, but it's how the funding is used. I think it's very important for our public safety to have the resources to address community engagement, to have the resources to address the changes that are being asked for. Our police department has been working on reforms for the past three years, <clears throat> but they have been somewhat challenged based on uh, their uh, personnel, and, the, and measure end funding is going towards our law enforcement uh, being able to have the staff to do more community engagement, more proactive community policing, to get at our quality assurance programs and so forth. I think also um, having officers not respond to lower priority issues because we're able to have some uh, staff come in that are clerical staff that has freed up our police uh, service technicians to go out in the field and take these lower priority calls as non-sworn employees. Not only is it cost effective, but it's also uh, follows the principles of 21st century policing that are being recommended to have um, uh, non-sworn officers and go and, and address those other issues that, that are not a life safety priority one issue. Um, I would also uh, suggest that uh, the chief of police is using these positions to be able to do a reorganization within his department uh, to, fo to have a unit that is focused entirely on community engagement and trust building. Uh, I'm very supportive of uh, collaborative strategies uh, to, to get at the issues uh, of complex urban environments. Um, and so this budget uh, balances many of these competing priorities and takes into account um, the, the modern practices that you know, people are asking for us to, to move in that direction. So with some of that uh, high level um, consideration, we'll get to a few specifics. So there are very important strategic investments in this budget. These are actually not huge dollar amounts, but these represent some important studies and efforts that will inform the city about how we can go after the right types of initiatives 
that have uh, even a greater return on investment. So that risk assessment is going to tell us a lot about areas where we can invest uh, to make improvements in the long run. Legislative advocacy has been something, again, this council's talked quite a bit about having a financial planning tool that looks 20 years out instead of you know three to five will help us in our decision making. Um, and then uh, on the police recruitment, uh, we know uh, of the impetus to uh, meet the expectations of Measure N, um, and so we want to be able to recruit well. And I would also reflect that a part of that recruitment budget that uh, Chief Terry and I have already talked about, we're going to have a set aside in there to also address diversity recruitment. Again, one of the issues that our community is uh, asking for. So. With some of those thoughts that I shared about uh, the overarching um, approach, um, I would r remind you know the council that in 2018, with the passage of um, public safety and vital services tax, uh, that there was the expectation that we would staff the police department to allow for those co positive community-based policing, and uh, that there has been pervasive communication about hiring 100 officers, um, and that was. Uh, a, a clear voice from this community. Um, I think, but also it's really important that, as I mentioned earlier, that's providing the resources to address improvements in the department around training and best practices and community engagement. So this proposed budget does allocate funding towards those areas and community-based programs within the police department. Um, again, I mentioned earlier, it's a, uh, it's a balancing act and the city does recognize that additional funding sources need to be identified by federal, state, regional, and local governments to better address many of our community and social needs, and I'll speak a little bit more to that uh, later. Um, but around um, uh, public safety, we are investing in uh, 29 positions. Again, this is to focus on priority one calls. There has been disinvestment historically in being able to get to the amount of officers that can have response times that are uh, reasonable and timely for those most urgent priority one calls. Um, and I've already mentioned uh, about our community engagement, but also uh, the follow-up on some of our um, cold cases and sexual assault cases. This is allowing us to get at some of those tough, tougher issues better. At the same rate, we are looking at civilian positions that are, are freeing up our staff to be able to go out into the field and to, to respond to those issues and address those priority two and priority three calls with non-sworn staff. And then on the fire department, uh, the, uh, there, there are two stations in our urban core that have been very hard pressed to uh, have uh, as timely of response times as uh, uh, our uh, outstanding fire department uh, expects. And in order to meet that demand, um, one of the you know, potential options could be that we would do an assessment, you know, do we try to add stations, but instead of doing that, because it's a very significant cost, staff looked at an, an opportunity to create some, some very nimble mobile squads that could respond to medical issues within that urban core and address that community need um, at a much more efficient cost. And, and address um, the community demand that is there and improve those response times and, and keep our other uh, engines available for um, uh, fire calls themselves. So let me switch gears now to talk a little bit about um, economic and community development. Again, that's one of our priority areas and an area where we have not been able to invest um, in um, past years. So we're creating the Economic and Community Development Department through these PSVS funds, and the goals of that department are to strengthen our economy, invest in our urban revitalization and downtown development, really enhance quality of life and uh, address some of our uh, public amenities, and homelessness as well as help us come out of COVID as strong as possible. Some of the specific programs that are in there is uh, working uh, on a sort of data and, per and performance analytics project with some partners, as well as working with the chamber on their Better Bakersfield and Boundless Kern initiative around um, an um, inclusive community prosperity. Uh, we're also looking to build out uh, business incentive tools um, through our economic development strategic plan, and uh, those tools will help to 
create things like uh, facade improvement loans, down payment assistance, uh, business assistance. And I would also reflect that we're setting aside 20% of the budget that's been outlined for that for our historically underutilized businesses or our, our uh, disadvantaged business enterprises uh, to help uh, in particular in our um, you know, urban uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods. We're also going to continue the economic opportunity areas, which are funding uh, economic development in our disadvantaged neighborhoods. We're going to be working on uh, our uh, clean city initiative, spending $1.5 million on cleanups for the city. Um, we're going to continue to have funding available for redevelopment and property acquisition. And we're also addressing uh, homelessness through the, the, um, the city's navigation center. Um, and then uh, I'll speak a little bit more about um, the, the dollar numbers, but there's, again, significant investment in homelessness and affordable housing as important social issues. So I, I just want to reflect really quickly, and this is super tiny, I apologize on the screen, but you know, there has been interest in additional funding th for public issues and community issues through public welfare. There's also interest in funding education at different levels. There's interest in addressing mental health and behavioral health, as well as affordable housing and homelessness, as I mentioned. One of the challenges in uh, the way that we've organized government in the United States is that not any one entity is wholly responsible for uh, all issues. And so typically, the state and school districts fund education. The state and county fund po uh, behavioral health and mental health. The city does not have programs in those areas. It is the federal government, the state and the county that typically fund affordable housing and homelessness. And it's the state and the county that typically fund public welfare. Where the city has stepped forward in recent years is to really look at economic and community development and increase our investment in trying to help our economy develop, but also get at the issues of homelessness and affordable housing. These are not typically areas that cities are responsible for, but we've put millions and millions of dollars in the last two budgets into uh, these important social issues because we hear from our community that they are indeed important. So this table reflects that, that, you know, as of two years ago, we had some federal grants and state grants that were helping us invest in those areas. But through the, the new resources available through PSVS, you can see that we've seen dramatic increases in those resources. In fact, in this coming year, there are $15 million that are going towards economic development, homelessness, and housing from PSVS alone. And I would just suggest uh, for consideration that our police department in next year's budget is being funded at a total of $16 million from PSVS. And again, these social areas are be funding, being funded at an amount of $15 million next year from PSVS. If you look at all funds together, because we're leveraging these state and uh, federal grants, it's $25 million of investment in homelessness, housing, and economic development in next year's budget. I want to just take a quick moment as I was reflecting again on the different areas, and again, this is largely for public um, record. From the federal government perspective, they largely fund our national debt, our Social Security, Medicare, and veterans benefits, the national defense, education, transportation, and health. The state spends significantly on K through 12 education, higher education, health and human services, a lower percentage on corrections and rehabilitation, and there are some other areas that are, are sort of you know, joined together in a, in a miscellaneous bucket. This is from our uh, Kern County um, tax assessor. This is property taxes. Uh, those property taxes, 59% of property taxes go to schools. 18% go to the county general fund, 11% to county fire, special districts 6%, and cities see 6% of property tax of all taxes received in our county. And I, I should have mentioned before, again, the federal government, it's a $4 trillion budget. The state is $209 billion. The county, $2.2 billion. So you just see the order of magnitude and scale there. And then we get to the city where we have $630 million across all funds. If you look across all funds, we spend in a variety of different areas. And you see our economic development now, fortunately, is up to 5%. It was lower before. 
Uh, recreation is about 5%. Public works uh, has significant demands at 31%. Fires at 8%. Police is just below 20%. Uh, and our non-departmental, again, is in general government are somewhat miscellaneous, but um, not significant portions there either. And I just also want to reflect that the sales tax that we receive is 1% of all taxes that are generated by sales tax, the rest goes to the state. And these are from the Urban Institute. This is um, from some prior years because the Urban Institute doesn't have um, per, uh, an updated numbers all the time. But this just reflects, again, some percentages of the investment if you look at all government funding that is a state and local that, uh, again, a, a city's budget may not address uh, public welfare and education but is significantly addressed in state and county and school district budgets. And for example, our school districts here in Kern County, they have $315 million in total operating budgets each year. Uh, and so uh, education does have significant investment uh, at the county level, uh, again, through that $315 million per year. So let me shift gears again now and, and talk a little bit about uh, quality of life projects specific to public safety and vital services. Um, in parks, we are trying to leverage uh, $3 million in grant funding. Uh, I heard clearly from the community when I came that they wanted to see our regional parks um, uh, investment be largely grant match as opposed to, to straight funds. And so we're funding more straight funds to, to our local parks. But we did, um, uh, we were able to get a very competitive federal grant uh, for a total of $3 million uh, specific to the Kaiser Sports Village next phase improvement. Um, and so we wanted to leverage funds in that way. Uh, but other improvements are focused on access, uh, and that is in the form of the ability to get to the parks and to use the parks, uh, both in parking and play structures and ADA compliance as well as some safety and, and playground rehabilitations for our neighborhood parks. Also, your council knows that there's a million dollars set aside to get at um, a lighting in our neighborhoods, as well as uh, beautification of uh, some of our entryways and first impression areas. And then I think it's important to point out our expansion of the rapid response teams to address homelessness challenges, both in uh, public rights away as well as in our parks. I just wanted to comment a little bit on deferred infrastructure and recognize that uh, we want to you know, allocate our Measure N funds as wisely as possible for the return on investment, but we do have some significant deferred infrastructure. I've communicated to council that our police department property room, the ability for them to do crime analysis and store DNA evidence is pretty important uh, for our operations. The fire station has been putting off a roof remodeling project for a couple of years. And the longer we delay, the more that we can see some increased costs for that deferred maintenance. And then I would uh, point to our fire station living conditions. Uh, there are some um, rehabilitations for some very old living spaces that need to be addressed sometime in our near future. And then the arena has two uh, projects that are related to safety. One is related to fire safety and electrical issue, as well as uh, one is a, a safety issue for workers there to be up in the rigging. And then some of the other smaller customer experience projects are on our contingent list that can wait and see till mid-year, but they will have a big return on investment for our visitors coming to the arena. With that, I wanted to also um, recognize that you know, we've re received some important community feedback through our oversight committee process. Uh, we've heard from folks that have been concerned about some of our capital projects. We've also heard concerns, um, as we did today, about uh, staffing. Um, and so I'll speak to both of those. On the capital project side, you know, the previous slide did talk about we, ha we do have some important deferrals that we need to get at in these next few years. Um, are there a few items that we could put on our contingent list as opposed to our initial list? I think that we can, um, but I think that we need to make sure that we address those uh, hopefully after mid-year. Uh, or, pot or potentially um, in um, coming years if you know, budgets continue to be constricted. And so there are two fire rehabilitation projects that are not on the contingent list that I think we could have on our contingent list. Um, and those would, uh, along with the arena, we have already uh, received feedback through uh, the oversight committee as well as a referral from Councilmember Gonzalez. And so um, that 
arena projects could be uh, deferred until other arena projects are complete. Those fire rehabilitations and the arena project combined represent about $700,000 that would be added to our contingency list that could then, you know, that would put it at about $8 million in contingency, a little more conservative than where we're at today, just based on the, the feedback that we've received. On the staff support um, positions, uh, there are um, many areas in which uh, the city is trying to push forward, as I mentioned, legislative advocacy, needing uh, some staff to be able to manage that process and manage uh, our advocacy efforts. Um, you know, it, it, that's part of, we feel, the, the council direction uh, around measure and priorities. Uh, but there are some staff positions in our fleet side and our technology side that we can uh, pace and take our time in filling those positions. Um, and so uh, there, are, there is a, a fleet mechanic um, that we, uh, would, we would look to, to hire some of those fleet positions, uh, two of those fleet positions initially. But there's a fleet mechanic too that we could pace the hiring of that and, and wait until we've hired the other positions assessed workloads and you know made assurances that um, that there the demand is there that we were expecting to be there and that may generate some savings in the next three to six months as we uh, wait to hire those in addition to uh, we may get to mid-year and say you know we we've we've been able to assess our f you know fleet operations and can see that uh, we can do it perhaps a little more efficiently um, and then on the technology services side, I, I would reflect to the council that we've had some communications that there are two supervisor positions that play some pretty specific roles for technology services that are important to move forward with. But we could look at um, uh, uh, the analyst positions and the technician positions and uh, delay the hiring of some of those positions um, and uh, pace those out as we really see the demand. And, and we estimate as staff that that's probably about $200,000 in savings if we delay out the hiring of uh, four different positions in that area. And so between those savings and the contingent projects, it's, it's about a million dollars of uh, uh, spending that we're gonna put in a little more of a delayed or contingent bucket to make sure that we're being just even that much more conservative uh, given the COVID realities that we're facing and, and, and reflecting the community feedback that we've received. So with that, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, we have some specific PSVS projects around quality of life, but there are some, some uh, other areas. So total, we're actually spending $14.5 million on parks in this coming year's budget. We're able to leverage um, two different grant uh, opportunities, one for the sports village I mentioned, but also another for uh, the Linnell Brahma um, Park uh, in Ward 1 and that's uh, gonna be a brand new uh, community park in the southeast. Um, we also have a number of other playground rehabilitations and access improvements uh, through several different funding sources in, um, outside of PSVS and some inside PSVS. And we're happy to say that we actually have neighborhood uh, parks projects budgeted in all council wards in this coming year. Um, you've been provided through Gen Info uh, the, a list of other park projects that are out there pending, and I think that over the next two to three years, we can really get at that full list. And this is the first set of uh, those projects that are reflective of that, um, and uh, we'll get through the rest um, in coming years. And then also just wanted to reflect, these are, these are outside of our typical general fund and PSVS general fund, is that we have $30 million of local road projects outside of TRIP that are gonna be happening in this coming year, which, which is a, a big investment and a little bit more than we've uh, seen in, in past years. Uh, at this point, I'm actually gonna turn time to uh, Chris Hewat to walk through a couple of miscellaneous items that are um, some more of our annual budget uh, topics and then walk through a few of the numbers and then we'll see if we can pause for any questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. Uh, I will walk you again through a couple items here real quick. Uh, the first uh, is a, a collection of miscellaneous items that you'll find within the budget. Uh, we're happy to let you know that we are recommending the continuation of contributions both to the Symphony and the Museum of Art, a council contingency in the amount of $50,000, uh, the popular spay and neuter voucher, the low-cost voucher program will continue. 
We've been able to reintroduce the monthly clinics uh, pre-COVID, and we're hoping to get back to those uh, here soon. Uh, those have been proven to be very popular, and those vouchers play a significant role uh, in reducing the pet population within the city and the region. We are still making that upfront payment to PERS on the unfunded liability component, which saves the city about a million dollars a year. That money is then rolled back into the reserves. Uh, as we have previously outlined and as the Council has directed through the reserve plan. Uh, and then finally, there is an annual required contribution to what's called the Hereditary Health Care Trust, uh, which again uh, is an important uh, financial component of the budget and that is fully funded. I quickly wanted to make a note about CARES Act funding. This is related to stimulus money that the federal government has approved uh, for governments and individuals and businesses related to the COVID response. Uh, the city will be the recipient uh, of up to, I believe, about $46 million uh, total. Uh, the first allocation comes from the County of Kern. Uh, that agreement was approved by your council last meeting. Uh, we'll receive up to $13 million from that source. And then, as I mentioned, we do expect to see an amount uh, directly allocated from the state to the city. Uh, we are awaiting a budget adoption at the state level and Department of Finance direction, uh, but we should be receiving that very quickly and the actual amount uh, will be determined at that point. This money can be used for very specific items, uh, most notably reimbursement of costs related to the COVID response, staff time, PPE, infrastructure, telecommuting costs. Uh, those type of costs will be submitted for reimbursement. Uh, we are actually exploring other allowable reimbursable expenditures uh, that would allow potentially some engagement with community partners. Uh, and we're working on following up uh, with uh, those community partners and with the proper uh, agencies to ensure that we're complying with F Federal Care Act uh, guidelines and regulations when we develop those programs. A little bit about staffing. Uh, all funds uh, looking to add about 97 positions throughout the organization next year. That includes those 91 positions funded through the PSVS measure. There are six non-PSVS measure funded positions. Those are all outside the general fund. They're in either in a special fund or, or an enterprise fund, so not funded through uh, discretionary revenues. Uh, they are funded by um, fees or charges for service uh, where the uh, need is there. So I will quickly summarize the proposed position additions. Uh, this is looking at the public safety vital services staffing proposals as we have outlined uh, in the documents provided to the City Council. Uh, again, uh, looking at, it should be 91 there at the bottom, I apologize, uh, but looking at those positions in descending order with police department at 44, fire at 13, uh, public works at 11, and then so on. Uh, we are also looking at six um, non-PSVS staffing, one in risk management funded through the self-insurance fund. This is an important safety and compliance position uh, and five within the public works department, mainly uh, within our enterprise funds, uh, again, providing direct services to residents such as refuse uh, and wastewater. So where does revenue come from from the city? Uh, this is all funds broken down uh, by category. So taxes and assessments are the largest sources of revenue, followed by charges for service. Uh, and then intergovernmental and transfers in, uh, which is uh, an accounting type procedure, account for uh, the next two largest sources of revenue. This is how that's broken down in terms of dollars uh, coming into the city for next year as proposed. Uh, so again, you can see uh, the dollar amounts associated with the percentages that I had just outlined for you. When we're looking at where that money goes uh, by department, again, we showed this slide earlier. I won't go in detail, uh, just to show that public works uh, is about a third or a little more than a third. Uh, the police department's at about 20 percent and then non-departmental, which includes uh, debt service and interfund transfers, uh, is at 15 percent. So again, the numbers in terms of where the funding is going, uh, you can see total public safety is about $171.1 million, uh, totaling a budget of $630.2 million. Uh, as we've mentioned previously, uh, the budget has been an evolving type of process this year. 
Uh, and so this number varies uh, ever so slightly from the number we saw uh, during our last meeting. Uh, and that was basically there was some accounting uh, cleanup that we did. It had no uh, change to any projects, any programs, services, or positions. Uh, it was merely uh, some accounting work to uh, comply with some state uh, items related to some funding uh, in the gas tax fund, actually. So uh, that's why you're seeing uh, the majority of the, the change between uh, the last time we showed you this number and uh, today. So again, just a, another way of looking at it, looking at an overall total increase of about 1.6%. That's made up of two components, an operating budget, your day-to-day -day type of expenses of about $543 million. It's about a 4.3% increase. And then a, a slight decrease on our capital improvements, mainly because we see fluctuations related to when we budget for certain trip earmarks. Uh, and those ebb and flow. You'll see less of that moving forward as we wind down the TRIP program. Uh, but this is a year-to-year -year comparison where we saw some uh, different uh, funding sources from the TRIP program uh, programmed last year, but not necessary to program this year. So that is why, in part, you see that decrease. Moving forward, uh, this is not uh, really truly the uh, end of the budget process, so to speak. Uh, there is the, the need to adopt a formal budget, but uh, moving forward, we see some items on the horizon that will need attention from both staff and the City Council. One, uh, we know that most likely the year-end investment returns for CalPERS uh, are not going to be positive, uh, and well, that will likely mean we are going to see uh, rate increases for uh, the employer rates, the amount the City pays uh, into the program increase starting in fiscal year 23. Uh, we are strategically making those budget allocations, again, to balance the immediate needs, but we do have those contingencies built in. Uh, so again, uh, there is some significant contingency within this budget to account for some of the unknowns that the city may be facing in the next six to 12 months. We are going to be coming to you more frequently uh, in terms of check-ins uh, to be scheduled, you know, moving into next fiscal year. Uh, will determine the need based upon uh, relevant data and information that needs to come to this council, but we do anticipate being to you more than just at mid-year. Uh, and then we're also looking to continue in enhancing our positive community engagement and dialogue in terms of participation related uh, to the PSVS spending priorities, and we'll be uh, making sure that those are, are refined and, and developed and enhanced moving into next fiscal year. So tonight you have three items before you that staff is recommending. One is the resolution adopting uh, the fiscal year 21 operating and capital budgets. The other is a statutory requirement. It's a resolution adopting what's called the city's appropriation limit. Uh, the, state, the state law uh, dictates through a calculation that we do every year uh, the maximum appropriations that the city can have in any given fiscal year. Calculated this year, that's about $453 million. Uh, and then there's certain proceeds of taxes that are, that are calculated that go against that appropriation limit. Uh, and that totals about $238 million. So when you look at the two numbers, we're well below that appropriations limit. And then finally, a new item uh, that you have not seen previously in terms of budget, budget adoption, and that's the approval of what's called the publicly available pay schedule. Uh, earlier this year, CalPERS issued a directive to member agencies uh, requiring that the governing body approve essentially the salary schedule for every full-time position within the city of Bakersfield. Uh, we've had that information on the city's website within the budget document and many other places for many years. Uh, this is an additional uh, requirement through CalPERS, so that, is, that also appears uh, on this item and within your packet. At this point, uh, I am done, and we'll turn back over to Council for questions and uh, recommended action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hewat and Mr. Clegg. Colleagues? May Mayor Go, before you call for your colleagues' comments, I'd like to announce that additional um, correspondence was received regarding this item. Um, and regarding the numerous comments and voicemails received, the comments are available for public review in the clerk's office. We have also provide, provided um, a staff memorandum that summarizes what those comments were. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Colleagues? 
any questions or comments. And then colleagues on the phone, would you please indicate your desire to speak to the city clerk? And then city clerk, if you could hold up that card if anybody wants to speak. So uh, it's blank on that side. Councilmember Freeman, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> this is for either Chris uh, or Christian. Um, could you summarize again uh, for me the number of positions, to the, the operating uh, positions, it, that you're calling contingent or you said you would be deferring? Like how many and how much uh, on an annual basis do those represent? Council Mayor Freeman and <clears throat> Mayor and Council, uh, there are four positions uh, and those reflect about $400,000 for a total annual fiscal. Uh, it would be about $200,000 if we revisit that at mid-year. Okay, so there's four. Those are in the various technical and, and uh, you know, non-public safety types, John. Could you, um, uh, could you talk again about the fire department uh, are you talking about hiring 12, first of all, is it 12 people uh, or six people for these uh, units that will go to the various areas? Thank you, council member and mayor and council. It is 12 full-time positions. It's two units, um, but it's, it's six uh, firefighters and six captains so that there are two people manning those units 24 uh, hours a day. So it is 12 positions. Okay. And, and how much on an annual uh, cost basis, you know, salary and everything, uh, will that, those 12 cost us? That's about uh, $1.5 million. If my memory serves me correctly, it's $1.6 million. Uh, okay. Um, and then in capital projects, uh, could you s summarize again the ones that you're calling contingent, which I think you're saying we'll come back in the middle of the year and discuss them again. Um, could you summarize those for us too in sort of generally kind of what they are and how much money we're talking about? Yeah, it's, it's $7.2 million uh, in um, contingent projects. Moving the two uh, fire rehabilitation projects to contingent and, and, and the arena to contingent, it's about $8 million of contingent projects. Um, most of those projects are uh, city facility rehabilitations and park rehabilitations to summarize them um, broadly. Uh, and uh, the way that we are approaching this is that, again, you know, I, I would not recommend us going to mid year and completely revising and redoing that entire list. Uh, these are projects that if we come back to council and confirm that revenues have been received uh, that we anticipated and we do have the monies to fund these, that th this would be our priority list. I think if you know a conditions changed or an, an issue came up, we could take a look at some of those projects and say, you know, our, our, our transient occupancy tax is actually trending up more than we thought it would be right now. We don't want to be overly optimistic, but if we were able to sneak one more project in through those funds, great, we could take that uh, off one of these lists and, and fund something else. Another factor that could impact those is that we just received notice today, and I failed to mention it in my presentation, that uh, the Prop 68 grant uh, that we received for Linnell Brahma, there's also a per capita allocation from the state uh, for park funds, and that was $177 million at this, or excuse me, $177,000. I wish it was $177 million. $177,000 more for parks that we're getting that we didn't um, budget for. So that will be new appropriations that we can put at one of these park projects. But essentially, um, we, we would like to uh, you know, stay fairly true to this uh, contingent list. But it is true that we will wait until mid-year to, to move those projects forward after we check in with council. I, uh, just to be clear, you said fire again, and I'm, I don't want to mix up in my head capital fire projects with the 12 people. 
Were you mixing those in just now? I, I was not. There are the 12 people as well as some fire station living area rehabilitation projects that are also on the contingent list. Okay. And, and just once again, the to so we have about a million and a half in the 12 operating salaries and stuff for fire. We've got about 400 that you say we already can defer from uh, non-public safety positions. And what was the round number amount of capital projects that we can uh, put on this contingent deferred list and talk about later? What was the total dollars? $700,000. 700. Uh, here's my concern is um, we really don't know what we're facing from a, from an economy uh, economic standpoint you know we, we had some real serious challenges before COVID hit you know you talk to a lot of our big farmers because of all the China trade war and stuff we had some, they had they were not looking at good years we're talking about tens of millions in lost revenues for them. That's gonna affect us. Uh, oil we know is under complete attack uh, and it's gonna affect employment is already starting to, that's gonna affect us. So, you know, with COVID added on top of it, which is a real blow, you know, one gets a little nervous about what's it gonna look like a year from now in forecasting revenues. So given all that unknown, I. I want to. I want to be conservative. Um, I. I would think there might be a little more we could find in capital projects than seven hundred thousand that could be deferred, and I sure like to see us. You know, as much as I want these fire, there's a million and a half, and I really wish we could put that on the deferred list. It's like, do we really have to have it now? Can we wait halfway into the year and say, what do things look like for us now? Um, and, and the council decide at that point on those or defer them another, delay them another six months. Um, I, I know I would be more comfortable if we were able to, I guess, put a little more on the deferred list and, uh, and on, the op on, on the operating funds. And I really can't find anything other than the the, the new effort in fire, which I think is great. I applaud it. I'm not saying it, it wouldn't be great to have it. Um, we haven't had it apparently for forever. Um, it's just that kind of expansion at the moment. If it were normal times, I don't think I would be saying this. But in the face of uncertainty, I really don't want to be caught where we have to start cutting. Uh, so those are the areas I'm... I, w I wish we could, I, I would probably like to see the fire deferred for six months if we can decide then, or if we can do, decide, can we do half of it? You know, one unit instead of two. Um, but that's kind of my, my comments. I'd like to hear what other people have to say. And if I may, Mayor and Council, two important uh, thoughts to share r relative to um, those uh, thoughts from Councilmember Freeman. Uh, first, on our contingent bucket, again, we have $7 million of projects already contingent with this addition, that's $8 million of contingent, in addition to our $9.5 million in reserves, and in addition to okay. uh, our six to I seven. I don't know, that's why I asked to summarize it. You told yeah. me 700,000, now you told me 7 million. I, maybe I'm slow, I'm a little confused. Sorry, I and the, the 700,000 is, projects that were not previously contingent that will now become contingent, but it is a total of, with those, it's a total of $8 million in capital projects that we will not move on in the first okay. six months. So there are, okay, that's a different number, 8 million, but as far as operating, you know, bodies and stuff. Yeah, uh, so so I, I you know, I would, different. yeah, the, the, the question of the fire uh, squads, um, you know, it is at, at council discretion. What I would share that's important information to, to assess in that decision is that um, because uh, we had already reviewed the rescue squads in February at mid-year, the city council and the oversight committee approved purchasing those the two vehicles for those rescue squads and we moved up 
the time frame for the fire academy to hire those staff. So we've already graduated just a couple weeks ago staff that were anticipated for those rescue squads based on action taken in February. Of co course, you know, conditions do change with COVID, um, but uh, we, we, we may see some of those uh, grads, uh, you know, uh, may have to, um, go, you know, go to other agencies, uh, but we do have 13 individuals uh, that we anticipated bringing on uh, to the city um, based on, you know, previous action. Uh, what I would say is, you know, are you, we, you, are you saying they've already <laughs> that short for they've already been hired? They have been hired. <laughs> okay. All right. right. Councilmember Freeman, do you have anything further? Uh, no, I'd like to hear uh, uh, if there's comments from um, from other council people. Thank you. We'll have Councilmember Rivera followed by Councilmember Smith. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so a, f a few things based on your presentation, and I don't have a copy of it, so I, I know this has been said before, but sometimes it is easier if we have a hard copy of it to make notes on and go back and forth to. So I'm doing this from quick notes I was trying to make. I don't, so this parks the deferred maintenance list uh, from Diane we received in our packet on Friday is pretty substantial. Um, and I understand and appreciate the fact that we've got improvements happening in each ward. And I'm certainly excited that, you know, we were able to leverage um, city resources to get um, state dollars for, for a brand new park in Southeast Bakersfield. But um, it does seem to me there's a pretty big, thank you, it does seem to me there's a pretty big uh, list of um, a list of steps still outstanding. So, you know, when I think of, since it's what folks seem to be so fixated on, and and I know I've said it before, but when you consider we have a six hundred million dollar plus budget, um, this exercise when we talk about the budget cannot be consumed by Measure N every time. And and I know we've been dragged into that, and I think there's some important things to talk about as it relates to Measure N spending. Um, but we can't gloss over the fact that we've got uh, a significant amount of tax dollars being spent elsewhere that I think deserves our attention. So I see this big uh, defer, you know, deferment list, um, and I didn't see anything in here, and I know it was at least something I had raised with respect to um, uh, completing or endeavoring to start a comprehensive master parks plan, which, as I understood it, had nothing to do with where new parks would go, but was in fact was in fact going to be focused on um, how we get this list done quickly. Um, and I'd obviously like to, you know, I'd like to realize that sooner rather than later. So I don't see that in here, um, and maybe maybe I'm missing it, or maybe that is a priority, and that's something we're coming back to. But um, I don't see it here. I don't know if you want to respond to that real quick, Christian, before we. Yeah, thanks, Council Member and, and Mayor. Uh, we did not, uh, the, the, the budget that was proposed on the 10th, we haven't you know, made those changes in line items um, uh, since that time, but uh, it, it is not listed as a line item in the budget. Uh, to answer part of your referral, which uh, the staff is still working on the full referral that you made, but uh, a parks master plan like that would probably be able to be funded for um, about fifty thousand dollars. Okay, and that could come from again that council contingency or council discretionary um, pot from the measure in. Okay, I'm okay. So then I that's I'm glad to hear that. Um, that's definitely something I uh, I think this council should see soon. Um, there's an element in your and this again gets back to. Um, Measure N, not overshadowing the totality of our budget. But there was an item uh, on one of your slides as it related to positive community engagement and, particip uh, and participation um, and, and the need to improve on that. You know, I, obviously, this evening's, a, I think, an e example of that, though it's entirely possible um, it may not have uh, quelled what we heard. But I do think there's more for us to do there. Um, I recall uh, 
as a part of our council goals uh, discussion last year, uh, you know, suggesting that we look to other cities like San Jose, uh, even like Fresno, that have, um, you know, embraced this idea of participatory budgeting um, to see if there are ways for us to incorporate that into our process. It's the, you know, the ship sailed right now, and I get that. Um, but I really do want us to kind of renew um, our efforts to, to do that. And that, that engagement and that participation should, shouldn't just be about measure end dollars. Again, I want to make sure we're talking about the totality of the budget, and um, that's not just measure end resources. Um, you know, I, I don't know that, that I'm convinced that the four contingent new hires is necessarily um, enough, and, and I know you and I have had conversations about about the uh, the pace of, of staffing over the course of the last year and, and going into next year. But I also don't think that, uh, you know, conversations as it relates to staffing should, should now start, uh, you know, completely disseminating line items we see um, in new position requests. I mean, you know, let's talk about Measure N that in its title uh, was public safety um, and the notion that we'd uh, zero out new positions at the fire department just doesn't seem to add up to me. Um, I'd also say uh, that I think the best use uh, of measure and dollars is to uh, do those one-time expenditures that don't necessarily commit us to uh, long-term um, long-term funding requirements and when it comes to facility improvements we uh, we get that we get a one-time bang we get to improve something uh, it's good for our fire department it's good for the community and we don't have to pay for it again the next year and the longer we let something lag uh, I imagine the more expensive it gets so I, I do think that's another item uh, we should consider uh, when we talk about uh, amending the proposal you've brought to us um, so I'm, I'm not in favor of, of zeroing out those positions. I, I just don't think that makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, but I think, and you know, obviously we've talked about it tonight. It's not going to be uh, uh, an issue for me in six months anyway. But uh, I do think it's important that this council get an opportunity to check in with you regularly. And I think I saw that in your presentation. Um, uh, to Council Member Freeman's point, the we really don't know what's coming. Um, but I, I don't think we can necessarily hit the pause button and, you know, stop and kind of hold our breath waiting. Um, I do think we have to proceed, and I think there is a need um, and a request by the city to stand by, uh, you know, the commitment we made when uh, we passed Measure N and, and a commitment to ensure we're delivering services. So uh, I, I don't see the need to um, hit the brakes on, on a bunch of stuff, and I wouldn't be in favor of that um, this evening. Um, I think that's the extent of my comments now. Um, I'll let other folks speak. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rivera. Councilmember Smith next, followed by Councilmember Gonzalez. <laughs> Councilmember Smith. Hey, Mayor. Uh, could, Mr. Clegg, could you go back to, you had a slide that showed the contingency and the reserves and, and all of that added together on one slide. I think that's helpful for what we're talking about. We know, Councilmember Smith, there's a time lag, but do you see that now? No, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, maybe the, this is it. This is what I was thinking of. So, We've, we've funded, we've froze to the general fund. Uh, what's number two? That we, we, we decreased our revenue, anticipated revenues by 10%, which is what most cities are doing based on feedback from the state and from, from sales tax consultants. But you know, th that, was, that was a necessary measure based on what we think we'll receive, but it, it is a conservative estimate. Okay, so you, so we've re reduced what we think we'll get 10%. And then addition to that, so we, we started with a 90% of what we think we'll reduce. And then we have a reserve of 13%, and that's the 8.8 .8 million. 
contingency? It's 8.8 .8 million to reserves and about 700,000 to unreserved contingency. But yes, it's it's a 13% set aside. And then the, the capital projects is another 7 million contingent set aside till later in the year. Correct. And then what's the last item? The last oh, item. Oh, the additional. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the last item, these are uh, budgeted but unexpended revenues in the current fiscal year. So essentially our fund balance at the end of the fiscal year that is not being programmed forward. So typically on the general fund side, historically we've programmed forward our year end balance to help fund the next year. We're not doing that with PSVS uh, intentionally, and that will represent probably, you know, six to seven million dollars conservatively of additional contingency that if things get bad, we would look to that actually as the first pot, then the capital projects as the second pot, and then our reserves as a final pot. Okay, so all, all that totals like 23 million, three, Four and five, if I'm right. Correct. So we essentially have an additional $23 million that is not programmed in the budget that we are either setting aside or it's contingent till six months or we expect to get it from last year's budget. Correct. And when we say we try to approach it conservatively, that's conservative. The $23 million yeah. is not going to get spent yet. That's, that's important. And then Number two, again, we started with a 10% reduction from what we thought we would get. So I just, I just want to point that out to make it clear that you know, your $23 million essentially set aside that uh, is not programmed and that is there if things don't turn out like what we think. So I appreciate that. I think that's conservative. And I also appreciate uh, trying to listen to all the different aspects of the community. I mean, we, we heard it tonight. We want more law enforcement. We want less law enforcement. We want to spend more money on parks. We want to, uh, we want less staff. You know, we need, we need to do more. Uh, so it's definitely, you know, a lot of different criteria coming from a lot of different ways. And so I appreciate staff working with it. So, uh, I'm in favor. I, I think that staff's done a good job and, and really, you know, council goals, we, we start and, and we work with staff all through the year. It's not something that just came up. You, you mentioned, you know, you start in January, but I know that, you know, council goals have been there for a while and, and that's what staff works from and, and council members work with staff all throughout the year getting to this point. So I think uh, we're in a good place and I'm in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Smith. Council Member Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to follow up with uh, Council Member Smith's point real quick. So if you did take a look at, we took a look at the unexpended funds from this current fiscal year that we're pushing forward to this next year. The reserve of contingency uh, and then the contingency items that are budgeted in Measure N, um, $23 million. That's about roughly 34% of the budgeted allocations for measure N, is that correct? Or at least the, the expected revenue for measure N? Correct. Okay. Yeah, it seems, seems like a safe move for, for me. Um, I also wanted to ask, you know, I appreciate current tax, I appreciate the chamber and their involvement and all those who, who are part of the oversight committee for, for participating. Um, I, I just wanna make clear though for the public, when it came to the oversight committee meetings, uh, were there any areas, funding areas, that the majority of the committee did not approve? Councilmember Gonzalez, Mayor and Council, there was one item that um, a majority of uh, members uh, voted against. That was uh, the improvements to the arena, which represent about $315,000. Um, and again, uh, reflecting on our $69.5 million budget to have 
the $315,000 be the one item that did not have at least a consensus vote, um, I think demonstrated we, that we approached it from a balanced perspective. You didn't ask this, but I think in fairness, there were some votes that, you know, there was uh, important commentary that they were of concern and we, you know, we took that into account, but yes, it was uh, all items except for that one were approved by the committee. Okay, I just wanted to make that clear. And, and so with that item in particular, I made the referral at the last council meeting to actually make those items contingency items. So that has happened, correct? Correct, that has happened. Okay. Um, now, if we take a look at all of the other positions that are funded through Measure N, um, you know, I hear from people, they're concerned. I think it is wise uh, to follow up with the chamber and their recommendation for a fiscal policy for, uh, for Measure N. I'd like to make that referral tonight as well, that we follow up and bring that back. I know Councilmember Smith has made similar comments. Um, and I just want to illustrate a point. You know, over the last three and a half years since I've been on the council, I've been working on lots of projects with staff and I have much appreciation for staff and the dedication that they put into their jobs and serving the community. So this is not a critique at all, so please. Um, but there are a number of projects <laughs> in my ward that I have continued to push on. Uh, and, and if I may, I'm gonna highlight them now. Um, the Kentucky Street Greening Project, for example, that will imp make improvements to a disadvantaged neighborhood in East Bakersfield, all the way from, from Beale Street to Mount Vernon. Over a mile in uh, lighting, in green space, in walkable areas. I mean, this is a project that is already funded, that is still in design, that it needs to finish. Um, the Oleander Lighting Project, for us to improve street lightings in a historic neighborhood. Uh, the Beale Park New Restroom Project, which is still in development. We also have lots of different opportunities, and uh, I, I, I just want to, again, just to illustrate the point, um, we have lots of different uh, opportunities that, that we've already um, funded and we're trying to improve upon. Um, the e-permitting software for development services that's in development, uh, the body-worn cameras that we're still uh, deploying in the police department. Um, and, I, and I can go on and on, and maybe I will. Um, but, you know, $2.4 million for downtown revitalization. We have a chance to, to pursue a transformative climate community grant through the state for over $30 million to, again, reinvest in housing and workforce development in underserved, disadvantaged neighborhoods. There are lots of opportunities there. My fear is that if we continue to do less, with this philosophy of doing less, or doing more with less, <laughs> and, and, and we joked before Measure N that we were doing less with less, but if we continue with this philosophy, what opportunities are, are we going to lose if we don't fund these positions now? And that's not a rhetorical question. I, I, I'd like a, a response. If, is there a real risk of us uh, missing out on these opportunities uh, in the future. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez, Mayor and Council. Um, I, I'm gonna start off my uh, response um, with a, a, a comparison um, that I shared with uh, the Oversight Committee uh, for PSVS. So I came from the city of Stockton. I think it's fairly well known. Stockton was a city that faced a f significant fiscal distress um, and went through bankruptcy. They um, had to lay off 43% of their staff on the general fund side, 33% of their firefighters and 25% of their police. And after uh, they had made all of those uh, reductions, their workforce was larger than Bakersfield's workforce two years ago. And it's, it, yeah, it's something that I really respect about Bakersfield, that they've been able to find a way to make things work, roll up their sleeves and make it happen. And the reality is that we're gonna continue to do that. We're not gonna go and hire as many staff as the Santa Monica or as the San Jose. That's just not who we are. That's not how we operate in this community. We're gonna continue to be lean and mean and roll up our sleeves and do hard work. But uh, I would reflect that um, you know, th there is a long list of projects I think one of our challenges is that 
we increased our project list with Measure N significantly, you know, a year, year and a half ago. And we're still onboarding some of the staff and getting them really trained and really up to speed. I mean, our first police academy is just hitting the streets, you know, in, the, in, the, in these coming weeks. So there will be a little bit of a ramp up period as we build our capacity as a city and we will be able to do more projects with current staffing levels. But there is a real risk to your point that uh, if we want to get after opportunities we may not have enough staffing to complete those projects or to go after a grant. Mm -hmm. You know, it's fun, it's, it's exciting to think of leveraging grant dollars, but if you don't have enough staff to manage that project, then uh, it, it doesn't go well, you don't get the next grant, and, and on some opportunities we might have to say we're gonna have to defer that grant because we're stretched thin. And so um, I, I do think there was a right sizing of the organization through Measure N. I think we're actually pretty close to that at this point, absent public safety. We've made that commitment for the 100 officers. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if we continue to um, scrape by, I think it does impact our ability to deliver the highest quality of um, services. I appreciate that. You know, I was just thinking my, uh, some of my constituents in Westchester had this um, philosophy when it came to 24th Street, it was do it right, do it now. And I think for us in the council, we need to have a similar philosophy of let's get things done, let's get things right. And so I appreciate your approach. And again, I appreciate staff. And so I think you know some of this is an investment to, to really get us uh, to build that momentum necessary to get these projects done. Uh, many, of, many of these projects uh, that are desperately needed in, in, in all over the city, frankly. Um, and I will note that uh, the ongoing expenditures uh, for both phase one and phase two equals 53% of measure N. So there is that still that capacity for us to, to develop that fiscal policy that is, uh, I think, really a wise move. A and if I may make two quick points. One, I, I intended to mention this and failed to, that while the ongoing costs are 54% of the budget, mm -hmm. The staffing costs, as outlined in, in your uh, budget materials, are closer to 35%. Okay. Those other ongoing um, costs are things like our economic opportunity area, our clean teams, many of the things we've chosen to contract out. And so we do have the ability to s scale back some of those if we felt the need, conditions changed, so forth. Uh, it is about 35% of personnel is the ongoing costs for uh, PSVS. And then I, I have stated this publicly, I'm in support of establishing a policy that would uh, outline um, how much funding we want to commit to personnel for PSVS versus keeping that other funding available for projects and other initiatives. I think that's a good idea. The chamber suggested that through their letter to the city uh, today. Uh, the oversight committee has brought it up and I think that's a, a good uh, policy choice. I think we need to be careful to not over prescribe um, how that process works because we have the oversight committee and the budget process to get into some of those details. But I think a high level policy setting some benchmarks on funding limits is appropriate and we can bring that back. Uh, thank you, and I, I would say too, I think we owe it to those stakeholders to have those conversations, um, and, and I appreciate your willingness to do that. Um, I wanna also mention uh, and thank you for your, um, for your bringing up and uh, recognizing the People's Budget VACO. This is a group of people who have a noble cause. Um, they are stating that Black Lives Matter. They're trying to, they're working uh, with a larger movement throughout the country to root out systemic racism. Uh, they're working towards police, many police reforms and it's, it, is, it is a noble cause in my opinion. And so I appreciate you, your recognition of that. I do want to make clear though, and I'll, I'll do that through a series of questions, um, about some of the things that I've heard in my conversations with some of the folks who have asked for um, an adoption of uh, the people's uh, budget, BACO. First and foremost, and you covered this in your presentation, but I wanna underscore it. Um, why don't we fund education? So the scope of the city's jurisdiction does not include K through 12 education. It's the scope of the county um, superintendent of schools as well as school districts. And as I mentioned, they receive 
56% of property tax revenues go directly to school districts to provide that service. Yeah, I appreciate that. And again, it was uh, a question to, to highlight a point. I actually served on a school board for six years and our budget ranged from 260 to $280 million annually. And so, um, so I'm well aware of how, but how school district budgets are financed. Um, and, and mental health services, you referenced that. That is primary, primarily a, a county function. Mental health services is primarily a county function, primarily funded through state revenues to counties. Okay. But there are some positions that we can fund, right, uh, to help enhance um, our objective, really, which is to create safer, more vibrant neighborhoods, right? Because we know that in order to strengthen public safety, uh, we must address the social, the economic, and the environmental conditions that are linked, linked to crime. And that actually research has shown that communities are safer when residents have access to stable jobs, high quality schools, social services, clean and vibrant uh, public spaces, that all those things contribute to uh, safe neighborhoods. In, in your opinion, your expert opinion as a city manager, would, would you agree with that? I would agree with that, and I included in my presentation that I do think that there's opportunities for federal, state, and local governments to come together to think about how do we fund these you know, community-based and social programs in important and, and in different ways. I think it would be unfair, um, I don't mean that in a defensive sense, I, I, I think, I mean it, it would be unfair because we can't do it. It would be unfair for the city to try and hold that burden up ourselves, but we can be a convener and a, a partnership builder and a bridge builder to work with our county and to work with our schools and to do collective impact and, and shared strategies. And I think some place-based strategies in our disadvantaged neighborhoods is an appropriate goal to work towards. I appreciate that. And I like to make that referral and include that you look at how do we uh, create uh, new opportunities for additional positions in, in the city to help towards that goal, including violence interrupters, social workers, and substance abuse counselors. And let's include that in the longer term plan. Um, and I, I just want to note to the folks who are here, you know, at the last council meeting, I did make a, a referral regarding uh, the eight can't wait um, and, and asked that staff come back within 30 days with the action plan, as well as develop a citizens advisory committee that six months in time to review all the policies and ideas that are out there and come back with recommendations uh, for the chief, for the council, and for the city manager. We're working on that, correct, Mr. Club? Uh, correct, we are. In fact, last week, uh, the city published uh, a summary of where our policies stand related to the eight count wait policies, as well as those recommended by the state attorney general. And we are working on uh, creating a, a stakeholder group that we can convene to talk about these issues over the next few months with the police chief. Okay, and, and finally, I'm going to give my colleague uh, to the right of me, Councilman uh, Rivera, a parting gift and make another referral regarding the participa participatory budget process that we uh, develop a process to include more community stakeholders. I know because of COVID, um, our ability to respond or to reach out to the community um, was limited. Um, and obviously, you know, you have recently joined us, uh, maybe over 100 days now. Um, so there was a lot of, um, you know, transition uh, happening within the city. But as we move on to the next fiscal year, I'd like us to adopt a, a process. And I'd like to make a referral that we adopt a process to include more of the community and as we develop the budget. So we hear from all perspectives. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez, Councilmember Freeman, and then Vice Mayor. Councilmember Freeman, would you unmute yourself, please? Uh, yes, yeah. I just had um, one, one comment, actually, about parks. Uh, we had a list given to us. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Uh, we had a list of deferred maintenance, and I remember when it was first presented, Christian said, well, this was done a little quickly, uh, so I know people didn't have a lot of time. Uh, had, you know, a number of parks in my ward were on it, a number of parks that actually I designed and supervised the building of. So I went out to those parks and walked around and looked at the, the estimated renovation or whatever cost, 300000 And uh, I don't think it's going to cost us anywhere near those numbers to do what needs to be done at those parks. <laughs> so if, if the others follow, I found about Twenty-five to fifty thousand worth of improvements. <laughs> everything was, everything was in good condition, unless stuff under the ground isn't, or unless the light poles don't work. Um, they, it all needed painting, but uh, we can live for another year if the other parks are like that, without any big deal. If we can't get to them this year, and I think we can probably stretch our dollars when it comes to real bidding on what needs to be done at those parks. Um, I think. I'd be surprised if it costs us half that. So I think we're going to want to get a little closer to the numbers on renovating parks. Uh, when we talk about 5 million, if it's really only two, uh, we can do a lot more other parks is my point. So I bring that up because I was kind of surprised that I couldn't find any way we could spend the money that was, I know it was quick and dirty, but that was put in those columns. Um, so I, you know, I hope we can look a little more closely into that and plan. We might be able to save money on some of the renovation we're doing this year when we actually get into bidding what really needs to be done. But uh, most of that stuff lasts a long time. So that I just wanted to make people aware of that. I think we're gonna be able to do more than we thought. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Freeman. Mr. Clegg, would you like to respond to that? Uh, I would just say we'll, we'll take a keen eye, Council Member. Thank you for that feedback. Okay. Thank you. And now, Vice Mayor. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Clegg, we used to have what the state had was a redevelopment agency, and that afforded municipalities to be able to do affordable housing, uh, primarily in underserved areas of the community. And uh, unfortunately, that tool has gone away. So it's fallen on the backs of cities that try and be able to balance uh, affordable housing. Uh, so if you can just touch a little bit on what we've done along with homelessness, because that was brought up tonight, and uh, even with our uh, limited funds that we're still able, compared to what the state had and what they were offering us before, what we're able to do. Yeah, thanks, Council Member, uh, or thanks, Vice Mayor, uh, for the question, and Council uh, and Mayor. Uh, the, the, it is accurate that the redevelopment agencies have gone away uh, that represents millions of dollars of uh, lost revenues that we were able to put into affordable housing as well as economic development and redevelopment. And what uh, the city has done in the last two years, I would uh, distinguish in particular compared to prior years, the city does receive federal funding and state funding to do a, um, a small number of programs and that was probably to the tune of about a million, a million and a half dollars a year of affordable housing. In the last two years, We've committed um, um, about $10 million towards affordable housing and homelessness last year. This coming year, um, it's uh, an, about uh, another, I think, $11 million in total. Um, we have um, $7.3 million in the PSVS budget next year for affordable housing projects alone. And so this is the city providing our general fund revenues to um, affordable housing developers to be able to put their projects together to create more units of affordable housing. We've also worked very closely with a regional collaboration, the, the Bakersfield Kern Regional Homeless Collaborative, uh, to get at the issue of homelessness. And we've leveraged those state funds that we've received, uh, several uh, million dollars of state funds uh, to be able to help our local shelters uh, expand their bed capacity, uh, 40 beds at each of the mission and uh, the Bakersfield Homeless Center. We've also used funding to help the county uh, operate in this initial year, their new shelter, and of course pursued the city's own navigation center um, uh, at a significant investment. But That's also our homeless center, right? Yes, our homeless center. Uh, which is a, a 150 beds added to um, the inventory of beds to address homelessness. In addition, we've uh, uh, you know, spent city resources to get at 
some of the more immediate uh, impacts of homelessness in our streets and parks and, and so forth through our rapid response teams to be able to go and address those areas. And we're working really closely with um, this collaborative that includes uh, outreach from flood ministries and many different partners to try and um, provide programming as well as beds to really get at homelessness in a different way. And again, in the last two years, we've been very significant investment. Thank you. Um, have you ever heard anything from the state? I mean, that was such a great program to offer to cities uh, that they're ever going to bring back, the governor's ever going to bring back something like that? Thank you, Vice Mayor and Mayor and Council. Uh, there have been several attempts legislatively to bring programs like that back that have failed. Uh, it represents a significant loss of revenues to the state, frankly, is my assessment on that and that the state is not likely to bring, bring back redevelopment the way that it was. They've created some uh, less uh, impactful tools that the city, that cities have available to them to create some sort of special areas and special districts, um, but we don't get some of that uh, tax increment like we used to. Um, and so we've looked at those programs here. Our economic opportunity areas are designed around those new state programs but it is unlikely that we'll see a um, significantly impactful program like that in the near future from the state. Well, I'm glad we're doing what we can. And, um, you know, it's just a shame because that program through the state really helped the minority communities. Yeah, two of my referrals that I made in the past, and we're funding them now, uh, body cameras for the police department and shot spotter. And, you know, we had a, a child killed just a, a few blocks from here uh, at California and P. And that child potentially, or at least the suspects that were involved in that, might have been caught if we had shot spotter in place then. And that has significantly helped that community. And uh, this budget is reflecting a, an expansion of that. Can you just talk a little bit about that and what that does for uh, underserved areas? Thank you, Vice Mayor, and uh, you make a good point that we didn't highlight that as one of our many improvements. We are expanding ShotSpotter. ShotSpotter is a, a, an early detection system for gunshot fire. Um, and one of the ways I think it's really important is that um, it's important in today's age to not have um, aggressive policing policies that, that disproportionately impact a particular neighborhood when it's a very small percentage of that neighborhood or people even who don't live there that are coming to that neighborhood that may be involved in group gun violence, um, that we target our uh, enforcement to those that are truly, you know, the ones that are involved in it and not to broader areas. And so it helps law enforcement to be very targeted, have good data, have good analysis and respond very quickly to be able to address individuals who are, who are picking up guns and using them. One of my last things, and uh, Councilman um, Rivera touched on this too, uh, the fire department. Primarily the, the needs for, again, the underserved area of, of our city, uh, I feel that the expansion of these personnel with the fire department should be able to aid those uh, communities too. So I'm in favor of that. So this is my fifth year on the council and you know, at 100 bucks a month, that's what every council member is making up here. Uh, we're part of the community, and we're here because we love our city, we love our community, and we try and do the best for it. So, fifth budget. Every budget that I've been a part of has never been perfect. There's always been competing interests. We've had more money, less money, and now a little bit more money. Um, and going forward, I'm sure other future budgets won't necessarily be perfect either. But if we continue our outreach, if we outreach to the community, if we outreach to our stakeholders, hopefully we get closer to that goal. And with that, I make a motion to approve. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Just going back to your comments about the redevelopment, the League of California City certainly has attempted to address that, but in keeping with what Mr. Clegg said, th that doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere. However, the good news is that as the big city mayors, we've been able to focus on homelessness, affordable housing. The $10 million that you said is 
um, something that we can continue as a bipartisan group to continue to advocate for, and we're committed to doing that. And so in those discussions, oftentimes there's that focus on how do we positively impact those who have been disproportionately and negatively impacted, and we will continue to attempt to bring state funding back to our community. I think we have some potentially good news now. So thank you, and then Councilmember Freeman, I know that you have a request to speak again. Oh, uh, no, I... I just saw a flag go up. Well, I guess you withdrew, so... Uh, you lower hand, okay. <laughs> lowered your hand. Uh, are there any other requests to speak? I know we have a motion on the floor. Is there anybody else? I'm just gonna give it a minute for those of you, especially on the phone. Okay, I don't see any requests, and so we have a motion on the floor with Vice Mayor. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Parlier. Aye. Councilmember Rivera. Aye. Councilmember Gonzalez. Aye. Councilmember Weir. Aye. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Sullivan. Aye. Motion is unanimously approved. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Council and Mayor's statements. Thank you. Colleagues, are there any requests to speak? Colleagues on the phone, Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a follow up, and I, and I know Mr. Clegg mentioned it, and also Councilman. Gonzalez, but uh, as we, you know, we finish one budget and we start the next one, that's the way it works. Uh, meeting with the chamber and and the stakeholders, I think is important, but also we've, we've already talked about, you know, continuing the reserves and, and a set aside every year and also a, a certain percentage for capital projects. I just want to reinforce that that's been stated by other uh, members, but I think, you know, as we move forward, we don't want to allocate all the money uh, or staff all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. Councilmember Sullivan. I thank you, Mayor. Um, Christian, thank you for the detailed report. You too, Chris, of course. But um, just well done and very well uh, the questions that were asked, you really knew the answers, and, and uh, certainly a lot of work was done. The budgets are a huge amount of work, uh, and, and the, the, the numbers were reworked and open and um, certainly, um, you know, wanting to, um, you know, we're, we're all conservative and, and fiscally conservative, certainly, and um, so being very willing to delay certain certain hires that was certainly appreciated um, <clears throat> so um, we just you know we're going through a tough time right now and we we you know we certainly somehow we need to uh, our community need all of our community needs to know that we do care and uh, so we I don't know how we're going to do a better job um, of just r reaching out and and getting over this. Hopefully, we can get over this difficult time that we're going through because we, you know, we are represented from we are voted and elected from our own areas of town, and um, you know, do our very best to represent our own areas but certainly represent and care about the entire city. So, um, you know, that just needs to be, both sides need to be very open and knowing that we're all on the same side. We, we're Bakersfield, California, and we care about our city. So, but, but good job with the report. Um, and <clears throat> so I think we've come up with something. And you know, Christian, I appreciated your, the example that you made 
about the, the number of employees in Stockton and then needed to, to um, uh, let different uh, employ and a certain number uh, uh, go and uh, but still under what we uh, we're still under what what they ended up with we th that's very clear that that's kind of a, a good a good example because we know you know we have always been in a position where we needed to do just work harder you know just work harder and keep the same uh, high standard that we're you know that our public expects and we've been able to do it you know the the our residents haven't really realized the the difficult financial times that we have been through because we our employees have just kept getting everything done so that was that was very helpful uh, so that was good all right thank you mayor Thank you, Councilmember Sullivan. Everybody, Jenny, thank you, and you know, good, good work. Colleagues on the phone, is there anyone else who would like to speak? We have a big opportunity in economic development. That is something that this council and staff have committed to, and going forward, I am optimistic that we will be able to make a difference in our community because of that. There is opportunity with what we call the B3, which is Better Bakersfield, Boundless Kern. That was addressed in prior meetings, but we have an opportunity there to engage with our community. Much of the focus there is addressing our community in an inclusive way. And that clearly has been stated in, the, in those goals. And I believe that's the opportunity that we have. I've already had discussions with uh, Mr. Clegg about hosting some Zoom meetings to invite community members to give input in economic development. I would love you all to start thinking about that as we move forward and uh, that is an area that together we can continue to get community input. So uh, hopefully, you know, right now we're in the Zoom period, but hopefully in the days going forward there will be a lot more research in um, in that area and many of you will have opportunities through different types of outreaches through the chamber and the other groups that we're hiring for more community input. We thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, very long meeting but we appreciate it and sometimes we can't act on what you're saying immediately but we we have heard you, we appreciate you and let our dialogue be ongoing. So that is the uh, invitation I think that this entire council and our staff wants to extend is let us uh, openly and, and um, let us continue to work together and we're going to achieve that if we will come to the table together. So thank you again for all of you. Thank you staff. And with that we are adjourned at 923. Thank you.